Hey, everybody, it is Corey Poirier, founder of Blue Talks, back with my uh, co host, my fantastic co host, Elise Rothman, uh, the founder of Flip Your Script and Yum Life. Elise, uh, how are things going? How are things since yesterday? What's all new? What's all the buzz? Well, I'm super excited to be back live with you today. Yesterday, we were having some tech issues on my end, but it was actually kind of nice to be backstage and comment on um, some of these amazing nuggets that we got. I mean, it was really incredible. Darlene Butts in her Clarity Project. I mean, the tips and mind seeds that we got from her yesterday, I'm like applying. I'm like, I'm going to do my call. I love to hear what she has to say. That was super exciting. Um, and so, yeah, so it was good to be backstage. It was different, uh, but it's, I'm happy to be here. And today I'm excited to hang out with Mitch again. We got to hang out with him, uh, last event, it, Laura, I'm excited to meet Laura Lake as well. And also D French is going to be with us today. So we have another great lineup and I think we're going to be interviewing almost all of them, right? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think this may be, I don't know, cause I'd have to go back and look, uh, I'm not a, um, uh, I'm not one of those people like the researchers that documents it all, but I feel like this might be the first time it's been an all interview day, but I might be wrong in that. I'm not, well, a, I'm not a historian. We'll see what so. happens. We'll see what yeah. happens. But I, don't, I know we didn't have, I know we've had few days that were all one or the other, which is cool. It mixes it up, but this, it could be record breaking today. Maybe the first ever all day uh, interview day. So sorry, yeah. I, I interrupted you. You're going to say something. No, it's no, it's fun. It's super exciting. So I'm um, wondering like what kind of, what was your, like the biggest nugget or mind seed that you got from yesterday? Do you remember? I know everything kind of, you have so much going on, you're moving. There's like a lot happening on your end for sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so for me, um, basically I, let's see nuggets. I mean, there were so many elements that I took away from yesterday. Like there were the, I mean, Darlene's whole presentation, was so powerful. I said it yesterday. I mean, I, I, I think probably, you know, when she got people to uh, list, I do this because of this for these people, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had that at, at you, I don't, if you know, if you, so a while ago, probably since you would have read it, but I don't know if you remember, but I put a similar thing in my book. Uh, the book of why and how is one of the exercises. Now I didn't dial it in as much as her because I was doing it on a personal versus professional route, but mm -hmm. I love that she got small business owners to realize what they do to get to the heart of what you really do and who you do it for. But then the secondary part, which I think was even maybe more for some people, it'd be more significant is then to say, where do you meet clients? How do you find your clients? You know, what's that starting point and how can you do more of that? For example, she said, you know, if it's not virtual events, but that's not your thing, then maybe you need to focus on could be podcasts. Well, you I know. like that she narrowed it down. So you might have seven or eight platforms that you use, but what are your top two? I'm always, I'll always tell my clients there's three things, you know, like three steps. If you can follow these three steps, you're on your way. And she and she did that for us as well. She's like, make a list, but where are the top two or three places that you get your leads or your clients from? One of the other things that um, touched me as well yesterday is our first speaker was sharing her story with us. Um, and I don't know, her name eludes me. Is that terrible? Linda, right? Oh, yes. Oh, that was baby. Uh, that was the day before, Linda, I believe. Lisa, 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 Lisa. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> so she shared her story about um, intuition and following your gut. And I have a story about a client, actually, that I just had this conversation with. And um, when she wasn't following her gut, just like Lisa shared her story, um, you know, her whole life was she felt like she was following her life as opposed to leading her life. And when she really got to the root of trusting herself and her gut, everything changed. And that's the biggest thing. You know, my son, the one thing that I, the one seed that I planted with my son is follow your gut. You know, even if I don't agree with what your gut's telling you, it's your gut and your guidance. And that's really key. And, um, you know, sometimes the lessons are harsh. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, she lost the thyroid and went through this whole process. But now she's learning how to not only lead herself um, and honor who she is now, but lead, help others lead their small and medium businesses um, in the same direction. So following your gut, that's a huge mind seed because your gut will guide you. And when you don't, when we don't follow our gut, it will get louder and louder and louder until it grabs our attention and it's not always pretty. Well, 
what, part of the reason, too, I mentioned with Arlene, as far as that being a big takeaway for me, is how dialed in she got to figuring out who you serve, how you serve them, and how you can find more of them. I love that. Um, but for me, I think most of the mind seeds were great. Either somebody was reminding me of something that I need to be doing, mm -hmm. or in the other cases, um, reminding me of the will of people, like Lisa, you know, sharing her story and um, all the stuff that she's gone through. But then um, at the same time, like with Dave Carroll, I mean, I know Dave's story. I've interviewed Dave numerous times. But one of the things we just started talking about is the synchronicities. What I, I mentioned about the Wayne Dyer story mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like he told me about the song and how he reached out to Wayne Dyer's daughter because she had a business and he knew small business owners will reply back quicker than a big influencer. So he knew he could get in contact that way. But I didn't re realize that about the idea that he got the song to him that way. And that, but nothing happened with the song, but Wayne was so inspired by his United Breaks Guitar story, he told Louise, hey, we need to get this guy's book out. But then the full circle synchronicity of the fact that then they would ultimately choose Dave's song to finish out Wayne's documentary. I didn't know that part. So I learned that story when we were prepping for this. And, and I didn't know the Eckhart Tolle Oprah part as well. So for me in that case, it just re further instills what we've been talking about a lot here is about the power of synchronicity. You know, if Dave, what if Dave would have uh, just said, well, the Oprah thing didn't work out. I'm going to throw the song in the garbage. You know, like it's, there's some elements that we realize over time that this can't be all coincidence. Well, you know, synchronicity is, I feel like, a side effect, right? It is the side effect of following your gut, following your intuition, follow your, following an inspired thought, no matter what anyone else says. Because when we do that, that's the tuning into these opportunities or the side effects that, that we call synchronicities. But we really play, we are the creative um, components to that. And when, when we recognize that our thoughts are the first step in emitting an emotion and a vibration and a passion and inspiration, and that's really, we can give the cues and be in a place of attraction and then those synchronicities show up. So I see synchronicities as a side effect of being in alignment with who we are, what we know and what we desire and believe. Absolutely. And so that was a big takeaway for me as well. So when we talk about mind seeds, it might be something I'm already practicing, but the idea of, um, us being able to will more of those things or because we notice them more of them happen every time one happens it reminds me you need to pay more attention to synchronicity you need to act on these you need, like it reminds me to do what my part to bring more of them into my life and right. so it might not be something i learned from dave because you know i believe in synchronicities and all that stuff but it is a reminder of how powerful they are and how um it's a lot life's a lot better when you have faith that these things are working for you then you try to argue, oh, it can't be. It's got to be just a regular coincidence. Well, listen, you get what you put your attention towards, right? You water it, you plant a tomato seed, you water a tomato seed, you're getting a tomato, you're not going to get a cucumber. I say it all the time. So if you focus on what you don't want and you keep focusing, focusing, I guarantee you what you, what you want is not going to show up. It might show up, but then you're not recognizing that you're actually playing a, a, a large role in creating that experience or that synchronicity. So when you said, well, you know, it will, it might show up, you know, or it sometimes shows up, you're playing a, a bigger role than I think you realize, Corey. I mean, you're planting a lot of amazing, you know, seeds of intention and belief and desire, and you're nurturing them and cultivating them and sowing them. Uh, look at this event, the stage that you've created without the stage, you know, I don't know where the flip your script event would be, but it wouldn't be on a blue talk stage. That's for sure. Well, and you're a part of that as well. And I know our, um, our fabulous and fantastic first guest is now in the backstage area. I'll just add to what you said, as far as the, um, you know, we talk often about the law of action and the key thing to note there is a Dave is taking action, not just the attraction he's manifesting because he's combining the two of them. He took action. He actually reached out to Wayne Dyer's daughter. He reached out to Oprah's producer. He reached out to Eckhart Tolle's office. He, they didn't just say, hey, Mr. Guy, we don't know. Do you happen to have a song we might like that we've never heard before? I mean, that doesn't happen ever. Yes. Did people get a call and somebody said, I heard your story from somebody else and they said, we need to turn it into a book and we want to do it. Does that happen? Yes. But it's more likely that you have to put the action out there in the first place. And then the secondary part to remember, and this is the big takeaway for people, I think, with the situation with Dave, 
is to not be so tied to the end result that you think that if it doesn't happen in that way, it's not going to happen or it wasn't meant to happen. You know, I share with you, at least, that um, John Gray, Mentor for Murr, shared with me, he did an attention every day for eight years about his book becoming a best-selling book. Well, I've had people say, well, he couldn't have been a very good manifester if it took him eight years. You're missing the boat of the fact that the guy achieved something nobody in history ever has. His book has sold 100 million copies. And yes, there's people who have sold that many books, but not in relationships. And so he was setting a big, like he was trying to manifest something, but think of how big the thing was. And so I'm sure during that time, it would have been easy for John to quit whenever he didn't get a call from somebody or something didn't work the way he planned. But he had faith that things were happening the right way and the end result would still be what it was meant to be. So what I'm getting at is Dave's end result was having his song be on Wayne Dyer's movie, not having his song be in Eckhart Tolle and Oprah's hands. But if he got too tied to the idea that it has to be the direction I'm planning, Oprah has to share it, then he would have missed out on the Wayne Dyer part. And maybe it was never meant to be in Oprah's hands. Maybe it was meant to be Wayne Dyer's. It just had to go through a different pattern. So I really feel we need to be open to the possibilities while also having faith that the universe is guiding us. That's just yeah, my thing. I always say anything is possible when you believe it is. But you got to believe it. 100%. Right? Having said that, I'm excited to, uh, I don't know how that's a segue, but I'm going to make it a segue to bring <laughs> on our uh, guest uh, who I uh, I think his shirt, he can, he can correct me. I, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong. But I think his shirt, is he wearing it? Yes, I see in the backstage he is. Uh, Savage in business, do I have it right? Okay. This is savage. Sorry, business savage, either or. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, I, I love that, first of all, because it's such a visual. But at the same time, uh, and hopefully he'll forgive me for saying this, but he's a big teddy bear, too. You know, he's he might be the savage in business, but he's also a really good dude, and he's got a really big heart. And so I'm super excited to bring him on because instead of doing a bio, because we'll get to talk to him and learn his story, uh, I'll say we had him on our Blue Talk stage in Western Canada. And this guy, first of all, rocked the stage. What he did that I thought was so powerful, and maybe we'll talk about that too, is he did a uh, more of a, um, what would you call it, interactive type talk, where he basically had people in front of him and he said, what I want you to do is everybody stand up. And he got us walking and standing up and moving. But he did this whole, uh, he did this whole thing where he basically got certain people to sit down by saying certain things. And then eventually said, there's this many people standing up. After 10 years, this is how many of you will still be left in business. And there was like three people out of a room of 80 or whatever. And Mitch, I probably, maybe I butchered that a little bit, but that was the, the gist of it. And I thought that was such a powerful image to, you know, to remind us. And for those people in the room to realize, wow, because it's, it's almost like, uh, uh, you know, a kick in the face about being a business owner that, wow, think about that. If you were one of the ones that was told to sit down, that might actually be a foreshadowing of what your business is like if you don't learn what Mitch has to share. You could be the person that was forced to sit down. Translation, you could be the person that's out of business. So I love that. To me, that describes Mitch in a nutshell. So let's bring him on, and we'll learn a lot more about him anyway during and a conversation. Are, uh, see, can you make it smaller so we can? I can try. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> da, da, da. I'm going to try my different options. Uh, it seems Sometimes it goes a little bit smaller, and that would be perfect. But if we want to go old school '80s newsroom, line us up three at a time, all the way across. I'll like be this, in there. We go. <laughs> right there. Yeah. We go. Usually, what happens is one of us is sure. like this, but for whatever reason, we're all pretty equal this time. Yeah, hey, Corey, sure. quick question before we get to Mitch's, you know, interview: uh, Are we on the Blue Talks Facebook group? Because yeah. Okay. I just want to check it out and see. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we get you front and center, Mitch. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I think I, even, I think I even pinned it to the top. Okay. Sounds so, good. Awesome. So, yeah. So I just double checked. Uh, we are definitely at the top of the page. So there you go. Um, so, yeah. So, Mitch, really excited to have you here today and exciting as well to uh, get the great knowledge that uh, Mitch came is, is going to. Uh, take us through and, and reveal to us. Uh, so Mitch, you know, maybe a good starting point would be to get you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you'll probably highlight the stuff that I would have missed out on. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we kick things off? Uh, absolutely. I mean, Corey, as you know, you and I have become friends over the last couple of years and at least you and I are just getting to know each other, but it's always lovely to be able to share this with you because this is part of the vision and the passion. And that's where I want to be at and not from some reflected side of things, the first essential element inside of business is not money. It's not sales. It's relationships. And in fact, the better you build relationships, the more likely you are to succeed given 
given long term. Why it satisfies conditions, proximity and mentorship. We get to work together on this today. We get to share today. And because of it, you get to learn and you get to share information and stuff like that. And all the speakers are fantastic at their job. And they get to take what they're passionate about. And you get to take that and leverage it. So you learn from the experience. And then what do you get to do? Other people that are proximate to you, close to you, get the get the byproduct, the feed off of that information. And it makes them smarter as well. So for us to succeed in business takes relationships. And that relationship led us to talking today, you and I. So for me, it's seven years that I've been doing what I do right now. I'm a business coach. It's simple language, right? I help people do stuff in business, really. Mm -hmm. Well, in seven years, you know, doing stuff in business doesn't sound very sexy. It's not. And then what do you get to do other people that are pro are you swearing, Corey? <laughs> Feedback. Nice. I can tell he's swearing right now. Just have right. your share. So, no, you know, we, we should we should do that. It's it's what we do. It's the format and the media that we're sitting in right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Seven years of just doing stuff. That is not sexy because business itself is not. It's what you do professionally. It's how you do it. It's the service, product, commodity offering that you do that is sexy. The, the service that I provide is not sexy. The result is, right? The start and the end are, are what's sexy that goes on in business. Business is mechanics. It's stuff day in and day out. But when we talked about failure and, and what I did at, at Blue Talks last year on that stage was critically important. We fail in 10 years, 97% of the time. Okay. The great Tony Robbins put it succinctly and perfectly. And I've heard this any number of times. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He goes, if you could play any sport in the world, with unlimited money at stakes and you could be the most popular person ever and you'd be loved and have the accolades from millions and millions of people. But you knew in 10 years, there was a 97% chance you would die. Would you still play? Mm. And he goes, that's what we do when we get into business every day. Our first two to three years are not safe. In fact, failure in our first two to three years is 84%. And that has more to do with, with what I call it, forgive the phrase, more balls than brains. In other words, we're really excited and we're really good at doing a thing, but we actually don't pay attention to the stuff we really need to be doing, which is what I do professionally on a daily -day basis. It's run a business. It's monitoring and measuring cash flow. It's understanding financials. It's organizing your time. Like that's that's painful to people, right? We hate being told we have to organize our time better. It's learning to sell better. I'm a pretty good salesperson if I can get in front of somebody. Bull. Absolute crap. No, you're not. You're terrible if you have to only get in front of people to do it. So we have to learn how to sell. We have to learn how to market. We have to learn how to hire. We have to learn how to manage and work with employees. Like that's frightening in and of itself. We manage cash flow. Well, here's here's a simple rule of thumb I use with people. Did you ever watch your grandparents or your parents balance their checkbook? If you ever learned to do that, you can manage cash flow in your business. But we forgot how to do that. We rely on the almighty device to give us answers at all times, but we don't use it to do something as simple as balance our checkbook and tell us, I've got this much money. Here's how much I'm going to spend in the next week. Do I have enough to get through or not? If not, what am I going to do? What am I going to solve? So what Mitch does in seven years really is the, the unsexy part of business. That's my professional life, but it's to make it so that you can go back to doing what is sexy and fun and enjoyable. You know, if you start out as a welder and account people, are like, oh, that's not sexy. Why not? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with working with your hands? What's wrong with making sure that people can maximize their taxable position? What's wrong with making sure that people get to keep as much money as they, as they, as they have? What if you're an engineer? That's not sexy. No, but it's smart. It's smart as hell. And it takes a great deal of work and dedication and, and precision. You can't have a wrong day at work if you're an engineer. The stuff starts to fall down and collapse on yourself, right? So but when you decide that you're going to run an engineering business or run an accounting business or, or run a welding business or sell books for a living or talk to people, there's a lot of unsexy parts that go into what creates failure. And in the first two to three years, it's those things that punish us, right? Uh, year five to seven, we think we're getting better if we survive five, six, seven years in business and failure drops to the, to the low 60% range. Awesome. Two thirds. Hey, that's better than nothing. I'm going to do it. We get tired. We get really, really tired of the same monotony. We get frustrated and we just give up. At year 10, businesses get old. And the why we fail so, so damned always is because we're just not inclined to stick to anything that long. We're not. So for us to succeed in business requires a lot of unsexy stuff. It requires a lot of notebooks. It requires keeping track of stuff. It requires spreadsheets or software. It requires all these other things, all these mechanics, and it requires technical skill. So Mitch does technical skill in a database. You're going, you're going man, it's, this sounds cool what you do at the same time. It doesn't sound too cool, but it's not. You know, I'll teach you how to sell. I'll teach you how to market. I'll teach you how to hire. I'll teach you how to manage your cash flow. 
but it's in the magnification of those things. It's in the taking away the the constraint, the pain, the the uncertainty, the the I just if I could just get it right once, I could go on to other things. And to narrow it down and make sense of it that allows you to take what you've built, something that likely you're passionate or you're technically really good at, and allow you to magnify that and grow that. And that's where businesses succeed. That's where they sustain. That's where you as a business owner becomes better because of it. And that all starts at the very beginning, which is why we're here today. It's the people you surround yourself with. It's the people you choose to do business with. It's the relationships you foster. To get you or a lease to buy is not a product of me asking you for money. It's a product of you guys getting to know me a lot better, understanding what I value, understanding the, the understanding what it means for me from a cultural standpoint to run a business. Then you go, okay, does Mitch have technical information? Does Corey have technical information? Does Elise have technical information that I could use that has a value in the form of trading currency for it? From there, do I genuinely trust them? So for me in business, at the end of the day, it is an awful lot of unsexy stuff and it's an awful lot of things that people can't want or don't do. But the moment they learn to do it, they can go back to doing what they love or what they're good at or what they enjoy to do when they wake up in the morning. People that weld for their entire life enjoy doing it. People that are accountants their entire life find find passion and compassion in doing it, that are engineers, that, that, that manage a Starbucks. People that continue to do these things day in and day out because they found the parts that bring them joy. Business is not a joyful thing. Succeeding in business is fun. Succeeding in business is joyful. So you help business owners, small, yeah. medium, and large, small, medium, and yeah. large, um, Doesn't matter. get their sexy on, really. So you're like behind the scenes, right? <laughs> I mean. Well, essentially, yes. I, I, I make sure that all the crap you have to write in this thing, and I'm showing off a notebook full of notes, and I got, well, this is how many I've got that I'm working with right now for however many clients and however many meetings I work through on a regular basis. I write a lot of notes, even though it's not my business. Why? It, it helps us to, to collate, to make sense. So yeah, Mitch's business is in the back end. Now Mitch is at the front, right? I'm at the front of the room. I'm talking to dozens you or hundreds of thousands of people. So you are a savage, right? so you have to have some front of the front of the room, front of the house. Exactly. Yeah. It has to be, has to be, must be. You 100% must be because the message is also universal. What I also teach is is not unique to one industry. It's not unique to one business. It's not uni unique to one size. These are constants. They are fundamental building blocks. Uh, if you're going to go to the gym, you don't get it right one day. If you go to the gym and you work out really hard one day and you don't see any growth and you think, well, crap, it's not worth it. I didn't get anything out of it. No, it has to be repetition day in and day out and day in and day out. And, and that's a lesson that I'm reminding myself about Right now, I, I entered one of these 100-day challenges inside another organization I'm part of, and part of it is a fitness component to go with stuff that has to do with my business and my relationships and my my life and all these other essential elements that are going on that are going to magnify and grow me individually. Well, guess what? It's 100 days of pop, 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 pop. That's but there's 100 days. Commitment, Mitch. 100 days. Well, <laughs> but it's well 100 days is a commitment but what we're really learning is new habits new behaviors right and that's what mitch really is is yeah there's here's how you sell and here's a, a piece of paper or a form and i mean in my language in my world it's people process and tool right there's somebody that does something there's the way they do it and there's the stuff they do it with if you're going to dig a ditch well you're going to have to have a person to dig the ditch they're going to need a shovel they're going to know where to dig they're going to need the most efficient. Is it the most efficient just to use a shovel to dig a ditch? Well, no, you get a backhoe. So what do you need? You need a dude that can drive a backhoe that can drag stuff up. So all of these is just a people processing tool. I hope to magnify that because that's the unsexy part of business, but that's the stuff that makes us bulletproof. And that is universal. I can only manage and measure cash flow a certain way. It's I either have more money or less money at the end of the day than I did before. What do I do to fix that? How much money am I going to spend this week, this month, this year? You know, the biggest companies on the planet, uh, the reason they're so successful, do something that grandma used to do by balancing the checkbook, which is manage cash flow. A great example of that, we're going, well, it's really important to me to ma manage my cash flow or for Corey to manage his cash flow or for Elise to manage your cash flow or anybody that might be watching to manage the cash flow. Why? If I don't, I might not have enough money to make my mortgage payment. I might not be able to pay my utilities. Well, let's take that lesson and extend it out to one of the biggest companies on the planet, Apple, right? In, in 2014, Apple had enough cash in the bank, not equity or leverage or all the other fancy words we've got for what big companies that have global presences do, um, but they had enough cash in the bank to buy their next six biggest competitors, which included Samsung, in cash. Take whatever the value of these companies are, go to the bank, take it out, get it in a block, 
and burr. Here you go. I'm putting, in this case, it would be us, uh, you know, a, a couple of armored cars full of money wheels up to Samsung's headquarters and says, it's the money's in the back, get out, right? It's all ours. And then we're like, this is only stop one today. We're going to stop five more times and ju just do this. So cash flow is universal. It, it's a thing that we can learn lessons from the bigger companies, but it has to be applied by doing something as simple as I've got this much money. Here's how much am I going to spend? This is what I got left over. What do I do about it? So that tells me how, how well I've got to do selling this week. That tells me that as I'm getting busier because I don't have more time to sell, that I have to get my marketing in line so my business can talk when I'm not in the room. These are the uni universal truths of a small business owner. There's not enough of me to sell and to market and to hire people and to, and to manage and to you know, build doors or you know, build a deck or, or, or do all the accounting for all the clients that my business has taken on. So now I have to bring other people in and I have to be able to take them and show them how to do their job well enough. So these all become universal constants. They become build building blocks, fundamentals. And then it's businesses become just like Lego. That's where you could focus on passion. That's where you can focus on magnifying what it is. That's where you can get your business to grow. Because if things work really well, it takes you very little time to solve the average problem. And when it's a big problem, it's very quick for you to respond and then get back to what you should be doing instead. So Mitch, I have a quick question in that regard. Yeah, yeah. I have a question, Corey. <laughs> okay. So um, on the cash flow side, I mean, I agree with obviously everything you just said. I guess here's what I'm wondering for those that are listening that may be in that category of the people that you told to sit down at the Blue Talks event. Like they're they're in the situation where they're always on the on the on the line. If you know what I mean? They're always mm -hmm. like, uh, are we gonna make rent this month? Are we gonna make this this month? So yeah. if they're in this kind of let's call it um they're already behind the eight ball. Yeah. What do you usually, when you're working with a company like that, how do you get them to the point where they can actually have cash flow? So instant, for instance, obviously one option is to increase their sales while yeah. also decreasing their expenses. One option is to decrease their expenses just on its own. Yeah. Um, I say the increased sales and decrease expenses because that widens the gap of how much cash flow yeah. they have. Yeah. But what do, what do you normally help them do? Like they might be in a sales thing where their capacity to sell because they're only one person is maxed out and they're like, bringing in 10,000 a month, but their expenses are like 9,500. So yeah, how do you yeah. help them start changing that? Well, it's, it's a great one. So uh, to, to paraphrase for the great Gary V, I'm about to give you 99% of the stuff I do for free, knowing that likely you're not going to do it. So you should probably come and hire me to help you figure it out anyway. Okay. <laughs> I, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, a tool set. Like we've all got cool names for this stuff, but it's, it's, it's fundamental ma ma mathematics. And, and economics. I, I call it the rule of ones and twos. Okay. If I can make a half a percent to 1% difference in my expenses and cost of goods. Okay. I want to pick five to eight things and I only want to change it by a little bit. Can I get my, and my cell phone bill in, in my household is incredibly high because I call all over North America and all over the world. And, you know, of course being smart, I make sure I've got a whole bunch of different cell phones to use for different things. And no, not burner phones. Like I'm a spy <laughs> just because I'm a business coach. Right. But so my cell phone bill is incredibly high. But if I can get that, it's one of my biggest expenses down by about a percent a month checkbox. So I've got one. Now I need another four to seven of these things. And then if I can get my utility bills, which is always a common one, um, if I can renegotiate with my landlord, even in the middle of a lease, you'd be surprised how often you might actually be able to do this and get it down just a little bit and take my bus biggest expenses and the most prevalent ones regularly. And I want to say half a percent to a percent. So my goal is to find somewhere about 5% savings on a month to month basis, but that has to be retained cash. Whatever I was spending before, I then be able to point to it in the bank account after and say, okay, I was used to spending it before and now I've got that extra. My job on the other end is not to expand past 10,000 of sales. We use your example. So I'm going to go from 9,500 in expenses. I want to drop, you know, 450 bucks. I want to get down to $9,100. Okay. Now this year, what's very likely going to be allowable inside the business system itself is not rapid expansion, you know, uh, but small. So I want to say, can I make it 3%? So at the end of the year, instead of $10,000, I want to be doing $10,300 a month. And I want to drop my expenses from 9,500 to 9,100. Well, that, that, that increases my cash flow on a monthly basis by $700. Just 7%. I've just made a 7% net difference in my retained cash at the end of the month. Instead of $500, well, I've got extra. I'm at 1200 bucks now. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm really I'm really moving the needle on the on my ability to hold on to that cash. Well, that cash at the end of the year, instead, what it was five hundred dollars a month is six thousand dollars. Well, now I'm at now I'm at fourteen thousand. 
So a small thing like that. Now what I do instead is I go, okay, I want to grow by 3% a year for the next three years. And I want to keep my expenses fixed because likely my business net is going to increase. If I increase 3% a year and that's compounded for the next three years, I grow by 11%, 11.4 at the top end. But my expenses stay fixed at 9,100 a month because very likely I can maintain my business growth like that. So now I expand by 11% over the next three years. And what I'm really doing in that time is I'm doing almost $12,000 a month in business, but my expenses are at 9,100. So over the course of three years, by making a little adjustment like that, I've now widened by cashable level by almost $3,000. So instead of having $6,000 at the end of the year, I have 36,000. Mm-hmm. But my sales have only gone up by $2,000 a month. It's, it's immeasurable what we can do with tiny little adjustments inside of a business. Now you can magnify it more than that because frankly, most businesses by margin, if I use a financial term for a moment, meaning that between where I make my revenue, in other words, the gross amount of money I make every month and my expenses and cost of goods, the margin is the percentage difference. So if I do $10,000 and I spend 9,000, my margin is 10%. There's 10% room. Well, over the course of those three years, I can change that margin to 29%. So my business is far more profitable but it keeps more money in my pocket. That's the end result for business is that it doesn't matter how well your accountant says your business is doing. It matters how much money you got in the bank. So a series of small adjustments. If I pick five things and I can save a percent and I just look to push my business a tiny little bit, little extra attention to detail. Well, that rule of ones and twos applies on the sales side, too. And there's a really great principle called the 10, 10, 10 rule is that if I'm used to selling to 10 people to get my $10,000 a month, if I can make that just 11. And where normally I was making $1,000, I can turn that to $1,100. And if I can get one referral a month out of all of those 11 clients now for the same amount, $1,100. Well, now my $10,000 for only the the value of doing two more customers has me doing $13,000 a month in business. So in the next month, I can go from doing $10,000 to $13,000 in the same example. But now I've lowered my expenses from $9,500 to $9,100. Now I've got almost four grand more in cash flow where I had $500 before. And, but I'm only servicing two more clients. So which, likely I'm not that much busier. Which, I mean, anybody should be able to get two more clients. And the other, one other thing I'll say, and I know Elise has a question, so I'll just say this one quick thing too. Uh, I, I think it, it's also knowing which expenses you can shave without mm-hmm. without costing you on the other end. And so an example, I just heard in the news recently, but uh, those watching may or may not know of WWE, which is the wrestling uh, business owned by Vincent K. McMahon, and they just announced in one of their shareholder earnings they had 500 million in cash flow, and it was a result of shareholders being worried about COVID and the effects. At the same time, they let go of I forget the number of employees, but anyway, the end result is of somebody who was bothered by them letting go of the employees crunched the numbers, and the number of uh, what the value of those employees they let go the cost of their salaries for the whole year was eight million. So the company just said we have 500 million in cash flow. But we're also going to let go of eight million dollars worth of people who one guy was with them for thirty six years, and mm-hmm. so wrestling fans and people in the wrestling world were basically criticizing the heck out of them, saying, "How dare they do these people when they got five hundred million in cash flow?" So my point is, them trying to save the eight million, maybe to make shareholders think we're willing to make changes, will probably cost them more in goodwill and branding than the eight yeah. million that they saved. Yeah. So I think you have to look at what expenses are you shaving. Make sure they're not the ones that are going to cost you. Goodwill, like if you get rid of your customer service department, if we're talking bigger numbers, that obviously could end up costing you more than you saved. Actually, I'll give you one quick example locally. There's a local bakery shop, and the guy runs it. It's really successful, like to the point where there's like it's a small shop, and every day you go there at lunch, there's 35 to 40 people waiting at least. And I sat down with him one time, and he said, "I said, how are you? Have you guys been so successful?" He said, "Well, we invest in our employees." All of our employees have been here forever. They all have health plans. And this is a bakery shop. And he said, Corey, if somebody came in to buy the bakery shop and they wanted to increase profit, what do you think the first thing they do would do is? And he said, the very first thing I guarantee they would do is go, why are we paying all these people? Why do we have all these group insurances and everything? Let's just get rid of those and we'll save an extra 300000 a year. But what's the turnover going to be? What's the cost going to be? Are people those people standing in line in a small town, are those their neighbors, friends, and cousins? Are they going to still go shop there? So my point, uh, Mitch, hopefully that makes sense, is that uh, look at the expenses you can shave off without without actually impacting your brain. So, Lisa, if I can get to your question in a second, I want to stay on that for a moment, Corey. You've hit it brilliantly. People capital. I'm going to use the HR term, human I capital. Yeah. Relationship capital. Right. Yeah, relationship capital, but human capital, the people element of your business is the only 
non-depreciating asset in your business. Let me translate it for you. If you treat your people like things, they're never going to grow. If you treat the people things in your business is the only one that's never going to degrade. Cars break down, computers break down, equipment breaks down, printers break down, software breaks down and degrades. It gets old, goes away. You know, the way we're talking to people on StreamYard, chances are in two years, isn't going to be around. It'll be somebody else's doing their thing and stuff like that. All this stuff goes away. But in the next two years, if we invest in just in the three of each other, the business magnifies. So let me let me put it put the stakes like that into really essential terms. Never cut from your people first. And businesses that go through what's called e-ship, employee share programs, in other words, where they take the business and regardless of size, little or big, and decide I'm going to invest in my employees. If they've been around for a while, you're like, I want you to be a partner and part of the business. Businesses that go through e-ship programs successfully, in other words, launch them and they have the right employees inside their business, typically grow by 50% after year one. So simply because I take the two of you and say, you guys are going to be invested in the business. You've been loyal employees up to now. I'm going to give you part of the business. At least you're going to get 10%, Corey, you get 10%. And we'll talk about another 10% after. You guys are vested, which means you're going to start enjoying the profits as well. Let's make this happen. Likely, we're going to grow by 50% in the next year if you're invested and you're down. Because now that you own it, there's always a next level that a human being can go to. And when I own it, as opposed to when I work there, is a very different mindset. It doesn't mean everybody should run out and turn their business into an e-ship for every employee they got. Hell no. No, you shouldn't do that. But it is a simple proven formula that if you've got well-invested employees, the moment you give them a stake, a cut of it, profit starts to increase. And that usually means retained earnings because everybody, it's like, yeah, we grew our sales by 50%, but how much money do we have left over to pay ourselves? Well, hell, that's not good enough. And so that really starts to double down on the people capital being the best, best investment in business because you can leverage a business so much more. And modeling, financial modeling proves that when you add so many employees, Revenue also increases given time if the business has the ability to absorb more business. Wow. Absolutely. So, perfect. Elise, I'll let, you, I'll let you jump into your question. I'm gonna like, tag, I'm going to like make a comment on that as well. I have a, friend, a, a, fr a dear friend of mine and a brilliant, brilliant um, business mogul, and she would go into cities that were going bankrupt. And this was 20, 30 years ago. There was a small town in California. And that town was going bankrupt. And she went in, and you could, you could go in. And it's almost like getting a, if you go into the military and you bid on a, you know, bid on a job or something. So she went, she bid on the city. And she found there was like 500 employees. And she narrowed it down to 78 employees and gave them stake. And um, said, okay, this, is the, this is what we're saving, okay, over the course of this. And whatever we save, we're going to split up, and that's going to be your bonus. Um, and 78 employees were able to take this entire city or count this county and change the face and it was more successful than it had ever been yeah. and they earned more money with like 78 people compared to 500 and so you actually when you're investing in human resource literally yeah. you, you don't need as many people because we're going to, somebody's going to stand up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to own this, right? I have a stake in this. I'm proud, right? So you're an invest, you're investing in someone's value. Yeah. yeah absolutely. They're going to take that value. They're going to own that value and recognize that what they do and their actions matter. So mm. along the same line, so you might be spending a little bit more, but really you're spending less because you don't need as many people because they're so vested. Does that make sense? <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, perfect. But it's really about recognizing people's value. And really, that's what we want ultimately is to have our value recognized. And when we do, mm -hmm. then we stand up and own it and recognize mm -hmm. that we make an impact and a difference. That mm -hmm. was not my question, but I just wanted to infuse that element <laughs> in there. Um, but I'm curious from a personal standpoint, because that's where I go. So what inspired you to take on this unsexy role in your life and, and own it so well and help people change their lives and their businesses? I got mad. I got really, I really so pissed off. Most, 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 most people, most people go, you, you you don't go to work for a good employer and eventually think, you know what? I think I could do this better and I'm going to quit. You don't, you don't leave good jobs. You have to have a series of bad jobs. Um, you know, I, I, I worked for Starbucks as a trainer. I worked for a, a number of other companies. I got to do some stuff, learned an awful lot of technical skills 
and, and kept seeing deficiencies over and over and over and over and over again. And then I got, you know, asked for advice occasionally, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start to moonlight and then you make a couple of bucks and you do a little bit of consulting. And it's the way a lot of us get started in consulting. You just, you kind of get invited and keep getting asked for advice and you go, well, can I get paid for this? Uh, you know, seven years ago, I decided that, that I wanted to get paid for this. I wanted to do it full time. I thought I'd accumulated enough stuff. And at the beginning, I focused on, on sales and marketing. I focused, focused on the business development cycle. If you can find more money, then you can take time to fix it. Right. I, I had a background in technical training and acumen to go with things like cash flow management, financial and stuff like that. So you don't get a degree in what I do. You don't. In fact, I've, right. I've got clients that have MBAs, but an MBA isn't proof against small business volatility. It's just not. MBAs are built for a larger capital class business. They're built to... To, to govern, run, organize, manage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Volatility happens inside of small businesses. So by predilection and design, I'm okay with that. I'm okay waking up in the morning and going, I don't know where the money's coming from. You know, that's so there's a, a natural component, certainly, but an awful lot of, of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears went in. And to realize that there's a tangible technical skill set and that the more questions I got asked, the more I answered, it started by proxy, then to turn into design. And now it's seven years later, seven years, 352 businesses and a, and a billion dollars in revenue. Later, here I sit talking with you to go, it's not, it's not complex, but you have to know where to get it. Right. And if you don't get it right, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, so I started because I was mad realizing that the stuff that I managed to accumulate by proxy and design in my head were things that were not constant. They were not common. It was not common information, common knowledge. There was no place to get it. So that had to be me, you know, and it was only one voice to start with. So to become only one voice, how do I magnify that? How do I talk to more people? So I could talk to one person right now and tomorrow I can talk to another person. And after three months, now I'm making just enough money to keep talking to people. How do I magnify that? So I have to learn how to market. I have to learn how to presence. I have to come on Corey and Elisa's show and go, hey, you know, it, it's stuff that you can learn to do and I can teach you to do it. I will give it to you. I won't give it to you for free. There's, yeah, there's a price, you know, right. but I will give it to you because you shouldn't be at the mercy of not knowing something that is simple. In most cases, it is simple. It doesn't mean it's easy to do. It does mean it's simple. You know and, what? And it sh Yay for you. Simple is not easy. Simple is no. just because no. it's simple. Sometimes the simplest things are overlooked or invalidated yeah. and are thrown to the side, but it could be that simple. Cash flow management is if I pop open a page, I mean, it's the next, overwhelming, so it doesn't seem simple. Well, in the next fifteen seconds, you could do it. Like we could, I could teach you how to do it in two okay. minutes. Let's do it. Uh, you want to do it right now? Okay. Take, yeah, a, piece, take a piece of paper. Absolutely, take a piece of paper. I can take it. Really simple. Awesome. At the top left hand corner, write how much money I have. Okay. And yeah. then after we're done on this call, you're going to open up your banking app, and you're going to look at all the money you've got inside your business, okay. all of it. What I have right now, whether it's credit, lines of credit, or cash in the bank. And you're going to write that number at the top of the page. Okay. The next line down, you're going to write, how much do I think I'm going to get? Okay. And that's over, I don't know, the next week, next 10 days, whatever it is. Whatever allotment you want to do when you're going to manage your cash flow. Okay. At the bottom of the page, on the left side, you're going to write people. So okay. even if it's just you, when do you have to pay people and how much do they need? Okay. In the top right corner of the page, you're going to write expenses. Okay. And then if, let's say you're going to do this on a week to week basis, how, what are my expenses going to be this week? Well, Mitch, I don't know what all my expenses are. Really? You don't, you don't know when you have to make a mortgage payment. You don't know when you have to make a lease payment. You don't know when your credit card minimum payment is. You don't know when your car payment is. You don't, you don't know when your cell phone payment is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bullshit. Okay. You absolutely know when 60, 70, 80, 90% of your bills are going to be. You just don't want to address them. Absolutely cannot. You need to write them down. What are they in every week? How do I satisfy this for myself? Every bill I've got, even the variable one-time ones, go in my calendar, which means this week I can look at right now, there's a whole line of green up here with the amounts I have to pay for all my bills. So every single week, I know how much money I'm going to need at the end of the week. Okay. I and like then at the bottom right corner of your page, you're going to write how much money you got left over. So in the top corner, let's say you've got a thousand dollars. How much money I have? I have a thousand dollars. Okay. So we're going to start with an example. And then I think I'm going to get a thousand dollars this week because that's what I have an in invoicing or I got clients that are going to pay, or I usually do about a thousand dollars in sales when I sell pens selling pens at a dollar a piece and i'm pretty sure i'm going to sell a thousand of them this week so i'm probably going to get a thousand dollars then where it says people i have to pay mitch me because i'm the only person selling pens a thousand dollars and i have to pay it well it's the 16th of the month so i already paid mitch mitch needs a thousand dollars at the end of the month so i got a thousand dollars september 30th and then over my expenses what do i need this week well 
I'm going to spend $500 for expenses. So this week, if I start with $1,000 and I know that I'm going to find or I'm pretty sure I'm going to find or I did find $1,000, so I should have $2,000 in cash this week. I don't have to pay me yet, but I know I'm not, I need to hold on to $1,000. And then I've spent $500 in expenses. At the end of the week, I better have $1,500 because I started with $1,000. I found $1,000. I spent $500 expenses. I better have $1,500 bucks at the end of the week. So at the end of the week, do I have $1,500? Good. If not, where did it go? Where did it go? What do I do? And then when I start next week, I better start with $1,500 at the top of the page. Then how much money did I find? Is that is that at the end of the month that I got to pay Mitch? No, not yet, but I know I'm working up towards it. What do I have for expenses next week? And this is a thing that you can do with five pieces of information and you could do in the next 10 minutes. How much money do I have? How much am I going to bring in or how much do I have to chase? When do I pay people? What are my expenses and what am I left with? Is what I'm left with up or down? If it's down, is that situational? In other words, the middle of the month is always the most expensive time of the month. In my household, it is. Between the 10th of the month and the 16th of the month, every single month, we have mortgage payments, line of credit, uh, life insurance payments, all these other things. There's a big chunk of money that goes out. So I always know between the 10th and the 16th, it's the most expensive time of our month. So by the 10th of the month, I know I have to have X amount of dollars to make my household and my business work. Otherwise, whoops, you know? So I, so something a small mechanic like that is a thing that you can do. And in my case, I advocate every week, right. like a day, Monday mornings, do your cash flow Monday morning. That way you're chasing it for the rest of the business week. You know, the rest of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I got to chase enough money to make sure I cover my bills or I better know how much I'm going to have left over and then next week, so on and so forth. So when we talk a mechanic, a simple process, it's not easy to do, but it's very simple to do. And once you get in the practice and do it for the next three weeks, you're going to be in the habit. So by the time you get to Christmas, 100 days from now, by the way, it's exactly 100 days to Christmas Day. So I challenge you to do your cash flow every week for the next 13 weeks, right up until Christmas. And by then it'll be a brand new habit. And you're going to be less surprised where the money's going. And guess what? What's watched is measured. What's measured grows, which means that the more I watch, the more mindful I am, the more conscientious I am. And then if I go, now I've got a goal. Now I can goal set. Hey, I need to have a thousand dollars extra at the end of every month. Now we start to do cash planning. Now we start to do financial planning for our business. But it all starts with me being able to jot five figures on a piece of paper and do it consistently enough that it makes a difference and an impact in my business and therefore an impact in my life. Now, is that something that you help clients with as well? Like once they're yeah. 13 weeks and they're realizing that there's like a gap between you know where they are and where they want to be. Um, yeah. Come to you. Do you work one on one with clients? Do you have a mastermind program where you can go online, work in groups? How could somebody find you? Um, uh, great question. Um, I work with clients two ways now. It used to just be one to one. I would only work with clients one to one. Um, I'm at capacity for one to one clients right now. I've got groups and masterminds launching right now, and that is progressive, meaning that as people start, they come in and join the same group. Because what, where did I start a conversation today? I build proximity and mentorship. Do you want people to leverage off of? I put people in groups and masterminds in pods to work on their businesses together because now they got leverage. Now they got people that they can trust are in the same spot they're in. It's okay to be a little vulnerable and do that. So they need to be able to reach me at MitchCamage.com. Find me all over social media. If you just type in at Mitch Camage, you're, you're going to find me. Right? Okay, perfect. And we'll put it in the comments below as well. Yeah. But yeah, I work with I work with people either way. You know, there's some people just prefer privacy. They, they really want, they really don't want another voice in the room and that's okay. Right. Uh, otherwise, you know, I put people into groups and masterminds and pods and, and, and my job, um, is, is also the part that I love about my business. I invest in long-term relationships. I've got clients that have been with me for three years. You know, if somebody wants a 12 week program out of Mitch, they ain't getting it. They're not getting it. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're in this for life, right? You can leave right. it any time, but you better get used to it because otherwise you're going to be hearing my voice on a week to week basis. And in the case of a client I talked to earlier, they're like, Every time I have a conversation with somebody, I could hear your voice in my head. I'm like, I don't know if that's a compliment, Probably. but you know, I'll take it. They're like, no, I'm talking about business and it's good. I'm like, okay, then there we go. So, so are you that's at .com as well. Like, do you have a website where we can find yeah. what you're, okay. MitchCamage.com actually my brand new sexy website's launching here right away too. So you guys got to watch out for that as well. But social media, social media is the best place to find me. <laughs> Awesome. Every other part of my life is sexy, except the stuff that I do professionally on a day-to-day -day basis, because I want people to get back to doing their sexy. I want them to have lots of fun. I want them to enjoy themselves. I want them to have quality time. I want them to have more money in their pocket. 
that's the that's year. If I got more money, more money and I got more time, then I can do what I really want to do. Right, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. You've been awesome, Corey. Yeah, I know I was going to say. Front and center, but look, you put me here, so. No, no, that's all right. I, I was, I was going to say, uh, no, that's perfect, Mitch. As always, uh, you absolutely deliver. Uh, I knew you would. I knew that the insight you were going to share would be game-changing for the right person at the right time. And I do highly recommend that if you're listening to this and you are struggling with what we talked about earlier, like I'm this close every month, reach out to this guy. I mean, this guy's the real deal. I mean, you you actually heard it here. Like one of the great things is, Mitch, as I said, you're interactive. I so you down right here. Hundred percent in real time. Uh, you you remind me, uh, and this is a hundred percent a compliment. So you don't have to wonder if it is or not. We had him on last time around. I. I'm trying to remember if he was on this one or the Amplifier message. I think he was on the Amplifier message, but at least you knew about him being on. Uh, Michael E. Gerber, the email. Yeah. Mitch, to me, you're like the modern day Michael E. Gerber. Ah. Uh, you're like, you know, Michael, Michael is, um, I mean, he's still teaching it. He's 84, I think, was he just celebrated his 84th birthday. He's still teaching it, and he's still got the energy of a 30-year-old, so he's not going anywhere. But what I mean is that, you know, you're teaching what he, what he taught, and you're teaching it in your own way, in the Mitch Kamage way. And that's the biggest compliment because there wasn't, there was only one Michael E. Gerber. You know, when he wrote yeah. the E-Myth, there's only one E-Myth. That book changed so many businesses. Um, you guys know that, what is it, 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Yeah. That, one, that franchise? Oh, yeah. That guy said that he sat on a beach and read the E-Myth. And the next day, he started the transformation to 1-800-GOT-JUNK from just a local one-off junk place. Now it's across North America. And then it was, I think, in Vancouver. And he said, all he did was he basically learned, he didn't even hire Michael, he just, what he learned in the book, he practiced it. And to me, that speaks volumes to who you are, Mitch. So keep on doing what you're doing. And what made me think of it is Michael wants to help you get away from doing the unsexy things so you can enjoy the sexy things. Yep. Bingo. Same idea. So I love it. So, Mitch, keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Seeing you again. And awesome. as you know, I'll call it a to be continued because I know you'll be back on the Blue Talk stage fairly soon. Uh, I know we're going to be coming up in the podcast, and I'm sure, and you guys can talk about this uh, off air, but I'm sure there might be a fit for him on some, at some point on the Flip Your Script Friday as well. Absolutely, Mitch. I'll be reaching out to you. Awesome. Let's do it. We'll make that happen. Awesome. So thanks so yeah. much. We'll send you to the backstage, and then uh, you'll probably disappear off the backside, but uh, we're going to bring on our next guest. But mm -hmm. thank you so much, Mitch. I so appreciate you. I know our audience does. Thank you for bringing your A-game as always. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I see that our other guest sent the heart sign as well to Mitch, our guest that's coming up right now. Uh, I'm going to, like we did yesterday, I'm going to, without any further ado, I'm going to bring her right up and then we'll uh, bring her on rather than uh, introducing her and then revealing her. Let's bring her right on so we maximize her time. Uh, Laura M. Lake, I don't know if I've ever asked you if the M should be there or if that was a Facebook thing. It's on mute, but, uh, Corey. Or, oh, yeah, you are actually. Uh, let's see My here. Oh, this way. There we go. I'll tell you the silly story that goes with that. My husband's cousin's name is actually Laura Lake. So messaging on Facebook, he's like, can you please put your middle initial so I don't send love notes to her? I was like, yes, dear. Oh, <laughs> so funny. What, what are the odds? His, his cousin, you said his cousin's name yeah. is Laura Lake. Like, what are the odds of that? that I don't know what they are. I don't know the I answer. Know I'm not asking you guys to tell me the number, but I mean, it's got to be pretty hard. What's that? I said I oh, married into I, the lake name, so I, cut, I just took her name. Her name is Laura. You married into the lake, and so there was a Laura Lake. So there you go. There's there's the chance. Okay. That, yeah. Okay, that makes it a little more likely, I guess. I was thinking of I don't know why, but I was thinking maiden name, you know, Laura Lake, and then him ah. having a cousin Laura Lake. I was like, I wasn't even cluing in. That's that's how that's how busy my life's been this week. Moving moving a house and running the virtual event. It's uh yeah. It's a different uh, it's a kids beast. and a new baby. Like, let's, you know, throw that in the mix. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then having an eight-week-old. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, that too. Um, so it's been pretty crazy. Uh, so, Laura, so excited to have you on. Uh, I guess, you know, where I'd like to start is can you, uh, like we did with Mitch, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and your backstory? I know I know a bit about it, but at least was just saying, I don't. So uh, I let, know, let's let you introduce yourself. I know you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so... My life's kind of been a mess since 2011, really. I was in a bicycle accident, you know, a pedal bike, on mm -hmm. my way to work back almost exactly nine years ago. And what had happened was I tried to avoid an SUV and hit a telephone pole instead. 
And while on the ground, a paramedic said to me, if you were any other person, you'd be dead right now. And those words haunted me to the point that I had PTSD and chronic pain for three years because of it. And in the midst of all of that, I realized that, hey, I'm in this false happiness. Like I'm not following the dreams that I said that I wanted as a kid. I'm not doing the things that I knew that I could do. I was doing what other people wanted me to do and what other people said I was good at doing. It didn't mean that I didn't love my life in different aspects, but it really shook me to say, hey, you could be doing exactly what you want to do if you put effort in because something is not right. Yeah, so I- What was, I'm so, I'm so curious. I'm like, so what did the little, ver the, the little girl want to do that she wasn't doing? <laughs> um, so, oh good. I, I was like, don't move sideways. Um, where do we go? Where did you go? We hopped off. I guess I'm going to go. Room now. Okay. Um, no, the little girl, ever since I was five, I, I loved architecture, but I also loved performing arts. Mm -hmm. I've always been a people person. And then the only summer camp I ever went to, so nerdy, was a science and entrepreneurship camp. So we made a, a laptop out of a pizza box and called it our business. <laughs> And I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur when I grow up, but I don't really know what this means. And I just, I always wanted to have my own architecture firm. I always wanted to be on the stage and doing some sort of performing arts. I did musical theater for a while, but I only didn't like speaking because every time in high school, they're like, here's your podium. Take your cue cards, put them on the podium. Oh, I can do for my own. Um memorized. That white kind of, I'm going to pass out no. feel before your eyes. Did you get that? Because I remember getting that in high school. Yes. Oh my God, I'm going to lose it. It was so, oh yeah, that your heart wants to stop and you just feel your throat in your chest and your stomach mm -hmm. wanting to come up at the same time. And I'm like, I can't do this. But I figured out why. It's because those types of speeches actually come from the mind, the logical thinking, the consciousness, mm -hmm. where you have to think your way through it and it wasn't about what I call heart-centered communication and heart-centered being. It, I call it freestyling, connecting with sore, <laughs> connecting and freestyling. Yeah. It's like, what are those passions that you have? What are your interests? How do you put you into that speech instead of feeling like a robot in front of a class that's just not listening because they don't care either? So tell us a little bit about, or tell me and us a little bit about, so where, so, so where are you now? Like now that you recognize that, you know, you were ready to like, you know, live the dream or at least start creating more, yes. you know, of who you are. Yeah. So the, the stage presence and the architecture has always been in the background. And when I started my architectural career, we did sustainable, what I call community-based buildings. So things like universities, fire stations, community centers, anywhere where the public gathered, right? I love those spaces because it was so Yeah, and it was all about the sustainability. So mm -hmm. the other part of me, the non-career part on the side that I wasn't allowed to do a whole lot, um, was really focused on health and wellness. Because after high school, you know, you. You go to university, you gain the whatever now amount of weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you learn a lot of life skills. You're back. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I realized I don't want to be like a lot of my family. Mm -hmm. So how do I prepare myself now to not be diseased around 40 and live into my 90s? Mm -hmm. And that was almost every woman in my family. Well, you know, you're not anyone but you, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. But young me was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So oh, is yeah. that the arena that you're in now? Or are you, are you are still doing architecture? Or are you more in health and wellness? Or like, so how have you transitioned? I'm still doing the root of everything that I've done. So the architecture, the performing arts, the health and wellness, it has always been about sustainable lifestyles. And I made up a word for my business. What is it? I, I call it sustainable design. Ooh, so the word sustainable is made up. You can't find it. It's it's made up. I like it. It stands for sustainable lifestyle design. 
And because my belief is that we have to meld human health with the health of the planet, I melded the two wor wor words together. Oh, I love that. I had a creative play space for kids all about upcycling and recycling um, back yeah. in New York City for years, and it was called Creatability. Ooh. It's all about our ability to create, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Flip Your Script is all about, too. It's about creating with thought first, right? Painting, using the paintbrush of your thoughts to create the life you love. So I love that. So is that a web, like, do you have a website? Do you have, like, you know, places where oh, yeah. you find you, too? And, and what are you doing in those arenas? Have you brought them together? Are you coaching? Are you speaking? What's going on, girl? <laughs> so you can find the best place to find me is on my Facebook page because that's where I put updates first. So it's facebook.com slash Laura Lake Designs with an S on the end. Okay. And one of the projects that I've been working on for the last year on and off because of the whole pandemic, I think I've thrown up in the air, is something that I'm launching right now. Right it? now with you, you're the first ones to know. <gasps> so I have this conference coming up in November called the Solopreneur Conference. And finally, I have the tickets up on the website. It's live. We're all ready. And it's called, well, the website is called solopreneurconference.com. And we can put that, or you can add that in the yeah. comments below, yeah. or you can kind of put that up there now if you want. Yeah. To. I don't but want the to whole point is to find those heart-centered entrepreneurs. And they spoke to me last year saying, oh my God, these small business events that we keep going to, why are they talking about storefronts? Why are they talking about investors? Why are they talking about staff that I don't have? Mm -hmm. I feel like I have to pick and choose and put the puzzle pieces together. So I said, I hear you, ideal clients. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this, but I'm gonna do my best to serve you in any way that I can. So that's where this conference came from, and that's exactly what I'm doing. So is this a virtual conference, or is it, it now? Well, yeah, the I call it the global plot twist. So, yes, yes. Uh, so it's a virtual event, and mm -hmm. tickets are available now. Now, as of like nine o'clock this morning. Is it? Oh my God, we know that, Corey. No, we didn't. No. And is it solopreneurconference.com? Sir. Solopreneurconference.com. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was on the right website before I posted it. So, yes. no, we, we did not know that. Well, I knew that she was doing an event, but I didn't know the tickets were going on sale today. Yeah. This wasn't planned. So, no. do you have speaker, are you having guest speakers? Are you are you yeah. seeing the event, or should we say virtually hosting, VHing the event? <laughs> I don't even know what you call I'm it. I'm hoping that a friend of mine is still going to be the mediator. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to open it up. I've reached out to a couple of Blue Talk speakers. And I hopefully, think that actually it popped up on my feed, my messenger now. I think we've connected somewhere yeah. down the line. Now it's it's all coming back to me now. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, we've got lots of good things coming. So, are you coaching right now? Or are you doing any like one on one? Or has the main focus been this huge event that you were committed to do? Because <laughs> it's the been main focus has been the the conference, but also in the back of my mind, I'm working with a coach, my mm -hmm. own coach. Mm -hmm. Every coach needs a coach, right? Every. So I'm working with my coach and I'm actually starting to build out a group coaching package. So it's not out yet, but I would love your feedback. And if you want to be part of it, what it's going to do is it's going to help solopreneurs really heal and empower their mental health mm -hmm. so that they can manage the four ways that they fail and turn them into their four keys to higher performance. Because that is what I do. Oh, I absolutely love it. So coming up with creative solutions for everyday success. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, perfect. mental health is just in everything. It's like I the way that you mental think. hygiene. Oh yeah. The way that think, the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we act and what we believe dictates eighty to ninety percent of everything that we do. Oh and if I can change ten percent of that, imagine the change in your life. Absolutely. Let me ask you this, because I've also had a similar experience at 18. I was paralyzed with an autoimmune disease that uh -huh. I didn't quite get hit or, or ride into anything, but it was a slow process and it was extremely scary and it propelled me into where I'm where I am now. But I recognize that my perspective and my thoughts really governed um, who I was to become and who I was in that moment. And that was really what I believed 
you know, my body heals, but you have to determine and believe that process yourself and whatever somebody else says doesn't matter. So if you had some, so when you had that turning point between PTSD and going through like, you know, the anxiety and the panic and all of those things attached to the chronic pain, what, what seeds of thought, what, what helped you flip your script, so to speak, and, and shift your focus and direction and start really restoring your life? I know the exact two moments. The oh, first perfect. moment was when my psychologist said, let's, let's prescribe mindfulness. And I went, okay, how is mindfulness different than meditation? And that was a big question. So then I went to the mindfulness class and everybody remembers my first day. Everybody that was there remembers my first day. All that happened was, you know, we go around the room, we say our first names because again, it's, it's confidential. It gets to me and I just ball, <laughs> like completely ball. My, my knuckles were white holding the chair. I didn't even say my name. And everybody's like, what's going on? And I told them, you know, my psychologist sent me here because I've had chronic pain for three years. I was in an accident. You know, this isn't going away. And she said, this is something that could help me. And then that finally released and was like, you know what, we're here. We're gonna support you through this. And it's a beautiful moment, so I tear up just a little bit. Yes, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, I have an EFT, I'm an EFT practitioner. Oh, yes. Yeah, so chronic pain was where I started, you know, my main focus because a lot of it is emotional and just getting that relief, that relief that you felt, I'm sure you felt it all over your body. And there was this like, right? This like mm -hmm. letting go. Yeah. And so that was number one. You went to and mind. Then number two was that EFT. Oh, <laughs> I did. I, I heard of I, the wellness expo. I'm a little bit more psychic than I thought, but <laughs> yeah. So EFT. Yeah. yeah. No, I met a gentleman at the wellness expo a few years. Okay. Many years ago now. Mm -hmm. And he saw me from across the room and he was like, come here. And I'm like, what? I don't want to be. He's like, just come here. So I went over and we had a conversation and he's like, can, can you start doing this stuff as we're talking? And I was like, okay. And then he starts talking to me and we're doing all this tapping at the same time. And by the, like, I think I only made it through one round of the mm -hmm. tapping. And I just, again, the tears just started flowing. And he's like, okay, I think we're ready to have the deeper conversation. Yeah. And it just, it all came out yes. for the first time. That's perfect. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. EFT is like a great, I call it the dental floss for emotional plaque. <laughs> I love it. It is. It's so like nice. floss. When we have this emotion, emotions that build up, it builds plaque. And when our, and the plaque builds up, our energy doesn't flow. When the energy doesn't flow, our body responds and it's not happy. No. So have you heard the phrase, phrase that emotions are just energy in motion? Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah. oh, I use yeah. it as a reference in, in one of my talks, but it is. And thoughts really are, the thoughts are the beginning of an emotion, right? Or which comes first, the thought or the emotion? I mean, that's a big yeah. question. Right. So the so, cue, yeah. The cue um, automatically creates the thought most of the time, like 99% of the time. Right. In environmental cues automatically make you think something. Then your thoughts create your emotions that happen, those physical states within our body. And then those physical states go, oh, let's create beliefs around this. And then those beliefs create a reality. Absolutely. We have so much to chat about. We're going to find Corey's like, oh my, here they are. Two, two people, like a match made, match made on Blue Talk stage right here, Corey. Absolutely. Okay. I love it. So, so what's this event coming up? What, what's the date of the event? Oh, Entrepreneur's Day, which is November 17th. Okay. Mm -hmm. I knew that. So November 17th, we'll have to put that on there as well. And is it sort of open to anybody who wants to come and participate? Uh, is there a fee attached? How do you get tickets? Yes. You know, that kind of thing. The tickets are only on our website. And there are two types of tickets. And then there's a caveat to it. But the, the first ticket is just general admission. You get to be there all day long from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Atlantic daylight time. Okay. So Halifax time. And it is jam-packed full of information, but not siloed information like you find at most events. Uh, what I did was I 
found the structure of no like buy trust, or sorry, no like trust buy. And I found that I have people knowing me, I have people liking me, I have people trusting me, why are they not buying? And it didn't matter how much I worked on the other three, I wasn't clear enough. Mm. I did not have that clarity of myself, of my message, of my life, of my business, and be able to put it all together so that I can relate that message in a way that they understand and that they care about enough to buy. So I, I reworked that whole framework and created my own framework, which I use for this conference. I love it. Can you say it again? Because I'm going to end up putting it in the comments. <laughs> I can share the seven step process if you want. Yeah. Do you want to do we have time super quick. Right now or do you have a download that we can also like put in the comments or I can add to the group where somebody can actually download it and have it as part of what I, what I call their guide? You got to get it from her. <laughs> Right now. Okay, there's, there's a course on it, which I did, and I'm probably going to do another one in October. So we you want to share the seven steps with us? Or? Yeah, I'll share just the basic seven steps with you. Yeah, Hello, just the bullet points. And do you mind if I share the bullet points in the group? No, or? not at all. Yeah. Okay, great, for the replay. Okay, yeah. step number one. So step number one is clarity. And why is my daughter in here? Please leave. I love you. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> She's 10, but I think she just wanted attention. <laughs> Yes. So step, one, step one is clarity, which is something we're all missing because it means we have to go deeper in ourselves. And that is scary. Okay. I understand how scary that is. I deal with mental health. That's why I do a lot of this stuff. So step one is clarity. Mm -hmm. Getting clear on you, your business, your life, and how you affect other people. Step two is attention. How are you getting attention from people? What is that message that you're trying to convey? Why should they care, frankly? Because when you're talking to someone, if it's not, have you heard of the reticular activating system? I don't know, tell me. Basically, it's this yeah. mental wall that says, if it's not relevant, Blah. not listening. <laughs> so we need to get past that by having a message that's relevant to them. We have these subconscious keywords like our name or anything that we care about that are like, oh, I'm paying attention no matter what's happening. That's right, Laura. Right? So our messaging has to be, <laughs> yeah, our messaging has to get us past that wall. And then once we're past that wall, that's when we can start building connections with people. So that's step three is connections or connection. Yeah. Again, we have to know ourselves deep enough that we can understand our clients deep enough. I can't love you if I don't know how to love myself. I can't support you if I don't know how to support myself. And this has been a huge lesson since my last PTSD in 2017. But it only took me six months to get over this instead of six years to get over the first one. It's so cool when you get back into alignment quicker. We're yeah. all going to get kicked out of I call it kicked out, kicked out of alignment. But when you get back in, it gets quick, easier each time. A little side note. As professionals, we are not immune to what we teach. I'm going to look in the camera. Okay, we're not immune. We're not immune. We we I'm not immune. We do not get a get out of being human free card. That's what no. I say. It just means that we know what to do. We catch it quicker. And we get out of it quicker. I love, I love your honesty. I'll also add to Laura, just really quickly. I don't want to throw you off of the seven, but um, what what you know, I use actually in speaking. I use this a lot. Getting past the wall, I'll actually intentionally, if I know two or three people in the room, then I'll I'll I'll, I'll mention their name during my talk. Yeah. Like I might say, um, you know, take for example, Elise, who's sitting there in the third row. And I'll do that if I know, say, three only three people in the audience of three or four or 500, because then the other ones are like, how does he know all our names? He might call on me soon. I better listen. Good. Yeah. So I use that. Yeah. And then another thing I do is uh, I'll open up with a talk where I ask questions in the talk. If I could get you a gig in stand-up comedy tonight, how many people jump on the stage? And what will happen is people will be doing this, and then they'll go, yes, that's a question. Uh oh what did he ask? And then they're worried, will he ask us another question that we need to know the answer to? And my point is, is that in speaking, I found that serves me really well for keeping the audience, uh, I don't want to say in line, but keeping their attention. Their activating system. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, I just, that's how I use it. If anybody's speaking and they want to know how can you use this to pull their attention in when they're on their phone the whole time, 
this is the way. If you can use the names of anybody, they're going to be scared they know your name. That Sorry, that you know their name. And then secondly, if you ask questions, they're going to be scared that they aren't listening to the question and you could call on them. So mm -hmm. use, that, use that to your advantage. Anyway, I love that. Seven, but that's We're on step number three, connection. That, that was good. I was clarity, very clear. attention, connection. Yes. So step one is clarity. Step two is attention. Step three is connection. The next step is value. Here's another part where we get messed up. We think we know our value. We really do. We lay it all out. It's part of our business plan. But what is the actual value that our clients say that we have or our potential clients? And the best ways to know that is ask, asking close friends, not family, close friends, you know, how do I make you feel? What is it that I do for you? And eventually, if you keep asking them questions like that, they just get pissed off and they're like, ah, well, you just got this energy and you're so damn strong. I don't know how you do it. And those words that pop out, you can add that to the value, right? So what is the value that you have to your clients? and to your clients' clients. Because you're not just helping them, you help whatever it is that they're trying to do. So whether it's their life, their community, or their clients, what is that value as well? Um, so that's step four. Step five is something that we think we're all good at because we're really good at doing the thing, whatever the thing is. Step five is service. How are you actually serving people? Are you serving yourself or are you serving them and their needs? Because that's where true service comes in. You want to give somebody five stars or do you want to give somebody three? You want that five stars. That's where testimonials come in. That's where people go, you have to go talk to Corey or you have to go talk to Elise or Laura. <laughs> so step, yeah, that was service. Seven, and the five. next one, yeah, six is inspiration. So inspiration is what motivates people to actually buy what you have. Is it a product or a service? What are the emotions behind it? We think we make decisions logically, or we try, but the weight is on the emotion. An example I like to give is my mom buying a new cell phone. If you just say it has new Bluetooth or upgraded Bluetooth, and it does blah, blah, blah. Mom doesn't care if, if all the phones say that. But if one company says, never drop a call with our updated Bluetooth, she doesn't care what else it says. That is her emotional trigger. That is what's going to inspire her to buy. And she will throw money at you just to not have to deal with the issues that she's already dealing with. So do you see the connections of the value and the clarity and the messaging and all of that I kind of cool thing? I'm so glad that you decided to share this with us because now we're becoming clearer mm -hmm. on what you provide as a service and what value you're bringing to the table. How convenient. Yes. Perfect. And what's and in the end? Number so seven. Step seven is another thing that we think we know, but we don't know that well. Change. Change. Yes. Change isn't just the immediate outcomes that you have with your clients. As we already said, what are the outcomes of your clients' clients or their community or their life? What are all of the patterns that happen because you changed one little thing? Right? We don't generally look past that first step. But when we dig deeper, we always have deeper connections. We always have greater value. So when you're creating change for your clients, dig deeper. Expand what that ripple effect looks like. Yeah. So the whole conference abides by this structure every Love single it. time. So, so that we have a storyline of education, not siloed education that you have to put together later. We so bring you through, yeah, step by step. So the day is going to be compiled of yes. step number one, clarity, yes. attention. Step number two, step number three is connection. Four is value. Five is service. Six is inf inspiration. And seven is the big old C word, change. Yes. That's beautiful. You've done so much <laughs> since your commitment to doing this. Like, this is amazing. Yes. I love that. 
well, I rewrote the process on marketing and sales without doing marketing and sales. I was like, okay. So but Laura, part, part of me didn't want to recognize that value and was like, oh, no, I'll just. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have a question, Laura, um, about the conference. So mm -hmm. I thought I heard you say, but then I'm not sure if you said it one way or another about um, when I least mentioned the speakers, you mentioned a, a couple of Blue Talk speakers. I know you, I saw you put a post about it. Did you line up the speakers or do you mean you're still looking for some speakers? Just so it's I know. It's not 100% confirmed yet, which is why I don't want to say specific names, okay. but I'm looking at two to three okay. Blue Talk speakers. Okay, and then um, the, that follows the other question of what you just said to Elise that the conference is going to follow this format. So I'm thinking that means the speakers that are selected, the speakers that are involved, will ha will under have to understand this format and follow it as well. Is yes. they're going to stay within. So I have reached out to certain people. I didn't want to put out an open call. I wanted it to be very specific, and some people that I had could no longer do it. So hence the slight open call for you guys. Right. Um, I'll just respond to the message that I did. So my yeah. <laughs> no, I wanted to be very structured with this conference. I didn't want people coming in saying, I have this expertise. It's like, no, I need you to do this process. And here are the types of things that we're going to talk about. Are you badass enough? And I use that word on purpose. Are you badass enough? Do you feel it? And do you know it enough to teach what I tell you to teach in your own way, in your own way to my audience? Because I already know, like for clarity, for step one, it's going to be about your story. So getting to know your own story so that you can understand your client's story. But I'm not telling my speaker how he's going to do that or what specifically to talk about. I told him the outcome that needs to happen is that the, they need to understand their values and their business values and how they're trying to help their clients. So their clients' mm -hmm. values. So that the next speaker, when they talk about attention, and we talk about our messaging, they can use that information that they gathered in group discussions. So it's only about 20 minutes of a talk, and then we do the other 20 minutes of group discussion at your table. So you're getting perspectives from other people. That's the other magic of this conference. I love it. And so the speakers now then, are all the speakers set? Because I know on the website you haven't announced speakers yet. So, or at least from what I've seen. Uh, so the speakers all set yet or like, and are you going to have, I mean, is the plan to have a keynote and what, like, I'm just curious the structure as far as that goes as well. So I'm our first keynote and okay. I talk about the why, you know, why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Why are all these things connected? Who am I? What do I stand for? Both me and the audience. So we're, I'm going to set everything up and help people understand the connection between you as a person, as a solo partner, and then you in your business. Because solo printers, that line is so blurred, and yet most people don't want to cross the line, and that's why they can't show up for their clients. Entrepreneurs generally have more employees and more of a brand that they have forward, and it's that brand that dictates which direction and decisions, but solo printers don't. Right, it's hard to yeah, sell everything. Out. Because you yeah. your because it's really your service. Yeah. Your service. It's you're selling yourself. When you have a company, when I had creativity, I could say, well, the creativity's rates are this, creativity's parties are this. So I could refer to the entity of. Yep. So it is, it's a big that's a, a, a thin line, but boy, is that a it's a strong line. <laughs> it really is. So there's there's a lot of personal development that I'm trying to sneak into business topics. There's also a lot of healing that I'm trying to sneak into business topics because yes, getting to know your story is a very personal thing. But if you want to help your clients, you have to get personal. If you're in business for money, no, no, no you don't have to get personal. But if you want to impact people, which is the target audience I have, like we mentioned, heart-centered solo printers, they want that impact. They're in business because they want to change the world. And if you want to change the world, you have to change yourself, understand yourself enough so that you can teach it to other people. Absolutely. And that's hard, but we're all there in that safe space to do it together, right? Get those different perspectives. Wow. So beautiful. <laughs> Love it. See? So, 
<laughs> so Laura, uh, as we start bringing things to a close, I know I can see our, our next speaker in the backstage area. So I, uh, I want to maximize time for everybody, but, um, you already told us the website of where we could learn more. Uh, obviously they can connect with you on Facebook. Is there anywhere else that you would send people or is there the other flip side is what I least likes to ask. Is there a mind seed you'd like to leave anybody with? No, uh, I, really am, I'm sorry. I like to leave. And that's kind of like the whole, this whole flip your script concept is about scripting the story, your story. Who are you? But who do you want to be? And how do you want to show up in the scene of your life? Because mm -hmm. every moment is a scene. And so if you don't like what you're thinking, mm -hmm. use it as a platform to flip it, girl. And then you <laughs> so but so I so I've created what I what I what I call mind seeds. We have thought weeds that turn into belief weeds. Yes. And as we pull them, we need to plant a new seed that we want to cultivate and sow and grow in our fertile mind. So they're called mind seeds with a Z because, you know, we don't want any conflict. So do you have a mind seed that our viewers live and on the replay can plant in their life starting today on a daily basis that they would want to have grow in their life? Part of me wants to use the same mind seed as I put in the Blue Tox book. Do it, girl. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So. But I'm, I'm going to give you, okay, two. The first one is short. The one that I put in the book is that everything is your choice. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, it is still a choice. So the okay. whole good day cookie story that started with my daughter that's at the beginning and the end of my chapter proves that it's a choice. You want to be happy? Choose to be happy right now. You want love? Choose to love yourself right now. You want success? Choose to be successful to the best of your ability right now. Yeah. And happiness is and happiness is free, by the way. Yeah. But the seed that I actually want to plant in people is is a little more, is a little deeper. Because I love deep conversations. You get no, to know me. Not. It's all about the deep stuff. So a lot of the fears that we have, the root of it is the fear of our own power. And that's because we fear that we're going to hurt people. Hence the trauma. Heal the trauma. And you won't be afraid to hurt people. Because hurt people hurt people, healed people, heal people. So if you want to stop being afraid of your own power because you're afraid to hurt people, start healing yourself so that you can heal other people and come into your power and use that power for the good that you know that you can do. Because it's we to break amazing. That down, girl. So how are we going to break that seed down? <laughs> so healed people, sorry, hurt people, hurt people, healed people, heal people. Okay, I like that. That's perfect. <laughs> You know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put it in the comments and or put it in a one sheet. So hurt people, hurt people. I like it. Yeah. It's it's in my last blog post on my website, and my website is Laura starts with B, the letter B. dot com. You know, you know what's interesting? Uh, Can you say that again. Did you write that down, Corey? Laura, um, it's Laura starts with B. Laura starts with B. Okay. I was actually posting the her people, her people, heal people, heal people, because uh, Shelly, my girlfriend, always talks about her people, her people, but I've never heard her say the heal people, heal people, and I don't know if she knows that. So I just quoted it as Laura saying it from the Blue Talk virtual event, but I tagged Shelly in so she could see that because yeah. now I'm sure she'll add that other part, but yeah. I've never heard that part as well before. No. Well, that was from a conversation that I had with a stranger that I met on the internet <laughs> last week. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds like a story. I do that a lot. Such a pleasure meeting you. I look forward to connecting with you mm. backstage or later yeah. on uh, to hear a little bit more about your event. Tell us the name of your event again, please. So it is Solopreneur Conference. The solo, no, just solopreneur, not the solopreneur. Solo. Uh, sometimes I put in the, if it works in the sentence. All right. Solopreneur Conference coming up November 17th, correct? Mm -hmm. Nine to six Atlantic time. Yep. Did I get that right? Yep. Perfect. And we can find tickets at solo. Yeah. Dot com or dot ca. Are you in Canada? Dot com. Dot com. Solopreneurconference.com. Yes. Solopreneurconference.com. And we'll put all that information in the comments below. Or you can feel free when you when you're when you're at when you when you're backstage to hop on and put comments on our group as well. It'll happen. <laughs> 
I have a secret. If you want a hundred dollars off the conference, get one of the uh, the courses before the conference, and you get a hundred dollars off. That's a good secret. Thank but you. that's because you have to invest in yourself and do the work. So I'm rewarding you. I like that. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll add one more thing for everybody other than us in Atlanta, Canada, and a couple other parts of the world. Uh, if you're wondering how that time zone translates to you. Seems like Eastern is always the one everybody knows. So, uh, so it's an hour earlier. So Eastern, you said it was nine to nine six, to nine six. eight to five. Yes. If you're in Eastern, thank yeah. you. Because I would have because that's, that's what I least been to. I was just doing that for Elise, but but saying it to everybody. No, but the truth is, when I'm doing any events, you probably saw. Even today, I was doing an announcement on the Blue Talks author group, and I never put Atlantic, even though Laura and I are both in Atlantic. And I met Laura actually at a conference in Halifax when I was living in Halifax. And I live in PEI now when I'm not traveling, which is three hours away, but I'm still in the same time zone. So her and I both speak like Atlantic all the time. But when I say it to other people, I'll say, I'm at three o'clock Atlantic. They say, okay, so Eastern? No, we're an hour ahead of it. Yeah, uh, Eastern. No, no, so you're Eastern. I think, no, I think you're Eastern. <laughs> like they argue with me about what time zone I'm in. Yes, because nobody believes that there's anything beyond Eastern, like nothing further than that. And by the way, just a, a secret for everybody else, Newfoundland is 30 minutes beyond us. So if they're on the half hour, so if you want to really get confused, if it's 12 o'clock for Elise, it's one o'clock for us. And if you're in Newfoundland, it's one thirty. And you're only like oh, right down the street, kind of, or another yeah. island, one island over. <laughs> well, a little, little bit of ways, but, uh, but still, I mean, the idea that they're on the half hour, it's so wonky. Like when you're, you're thinking, oh, they must be still open because it's five to five, but nope, sorry. It's 525 in Newfoundland. Oh, wow. But Newfoundland is its own country. Like, a, they, they make their own information that I don't know that I'll ever use. Unless no, you'll, you'll never use that. I, I live in, like I say, I live in, in what we call Atlantic Canada. Newfoundland's part of that. And I've never used the half hour thing other than to go, wait a minute. Are they open till 5 or 5.30 their time? Mm. I just think it's weird that you're on the half hour. I just think it's like any store, like is the store open till 5.30 when everybody else is open to 5? Well, they're still open to 5, but that means it's 4.30 for us. It's just a weird, weird thing. Well, we're because we're not in Newfoundland, so. Yeah. Disregard the information. Well, uh, I have to just tell you, it was such a pleasure meeting you. You're lovely and so much fun. And very much a nerd. <laughs> it's a 20-sided dice. 20-sided. Yeah. Mm, that sounds like a fun game. That's the symbol of, that. apparently that's the universal symbol of being a nerd. Yes. We found it. Oh, see, I guess I'm not a nerd. So that would probably be a thing like Sheldon might wear on Big Bang, and we wouldn't yeah. know why he's wearing it. Yeah. Like it. So you probably dig Big Bang Theory. I haven't watched it in a while, but yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm curious. I'm generally playing board games. I don't watch much TV. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know that you have to be a nerd to watch Big Bang or like Big Bang. It was. No, I, I, I like I like Sheldon. I get him. It, it, it was a top rated show on TV right till they finished. So obviously it's not just us cool nerds that like it. Yeah. Awesome. Same. Very cool. Well, Laura, Sam, I'm, a, I'm a nerd sandwich. <laughs> All right. Do that when I cross the street. Huh? <laughs> I say waka 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 when I cross the street. Girl, when you said you were looking for a badass speaker, you need to go to my website and check out elisehoffman.com. It's the, that's exactly what it says. Badass speaker. I'm like, she's talking to me. <laughs> so maybe we have more in common, even though I'm not a nerd. <laughs> They've had um, nerd, nerd potential. We all do, right, Corey? Yeah, I love all, everyone. It's all good. Yeah. Everybody has an inner nerd, I think. Awesome. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. All right, we're like totally like rambling right now. Do we have the next guest ready for us or what? Mwah. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Always a pleasure. We will, uh, somebody just said big nerd here, so I love you guys too. Um, awesome. You'll have to check who that is and, and make yes. a comment. Some of them we can't see and we can't see that one, who it was that posted it. But Laura, always a pleasure. Call it a to be continued. You're still going to be on the podcast soon. You're going to be speaking on that stage at Harvard soon. Lots of big stuff coming up for Laura M. M. I added the M in late. Just take out the M. Okay. We, we don't know your cousin, Laura. Uh, your cousin through marriage, Laura. So, Laura, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. We'll let you run for now, but we'll be talking again in the near future. Oh, love you too. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Oh, awesome. her. She's so <laughs> sweet and fun and resonates. Definitely awesome. resonates. Well, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to bring our next guest on because, again, I want to maximize time. I know today's a unique day. We have a guest that comes on after our next guest. Normally, we have three. We have a four. I don't even know who it is, Corey. Oh, I thought I told you. Okay. Well, um, well there's a 15 minute break between, so we'll be uh, buying some time anyway. So I figure we'll bring on our next guest. It's okay that we're a little bit over because we'll make it back up on the back end anyway. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. So here she is. Hello. Hi. How are you? You look I'm like. Well, how are you? Are you startled that you're on now live? <laughs> I'm okay. Awesome. So uh, this is Dee French. I'm so excited. I mean, her name's on the bottom, so I probably didn't have to add that. But Dee, so excited to have you here today. So excited to have you joining us. And, you know, what we've been doing today, it seems to be the theme, Dee, is maybe we'll get you to introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Because uh, in the past, we've done the bio thing. But sometimes when you're reading the bio thing, it's like it feels like it's not as authentic. And plus... We're not going to highlight something that you want to make sure that's mentioned. So uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, Dee, and then we'll jump into some questions and, and bring this thing into life. Okay. Well, my name is Dee French, and I'm from Efficiency Consultant, and I'm a leadership personal development consultant. And I generally um, believe in growing people and helping them leave a message, a life-giving message, to use that to create their legacy. And um, I did that because I remember one day I was in subways and I was speaking to this subway owner and he was so overwhelmed. He was so stressed out and his health was deteriorating and he had this business that he just wanted to just walk away from. But him walking away from it was leaving nothing behind for someone to know that he was even there. So speaking with him, and I was able to actually craft something for him where he was able to not only let them know the journey that he went through as a business owner, that it was also able to help someone else. So I believe that not only should we um, help other people, we should leave something behind for someone else to know that, that what we went through and how we overcame it, just so that we can be successful and they can see the journey. So that's kind of like what I did. And so this is a little bit about my story and what made me want it to um, just help leaders because I've seen the struggle. I remember when I was um, in business and I did this, had struggled when I felt like no one was helping me. And so when I was in that struggle, as far as going through my dad's death and, you know, a, a failed marriage, I needed someone to give me some guidance. I needed someone to show me how my business can, even though it was failing because I was going through so much in my mind, how do I turn that, switch that, flip that, like you said, how do I flip that to actually now make something that, that was bad? How do I turn it to be good? How do I use that message to turn it around to help somebody else so that they don't have to go through the same situation that I did? So that is why I started helping leaders and helping them use a message to craft that life-giving message that they always wanted to do, to leave the influence, to have the income and have the impact so now that they can leave a legacy as well. You go, girl. I love it. Can I ask you something? Are you from New York? You said Subway. Yes, I am. <laughs> Me too, girl. Okay. <laughs> she said Subway. I'm like, okay. Another yes. New Yorker in yes. the house. So New York. Yes. Are you in New York right now? Yes. Where, where are you, Corey? I just have to ask. Where in New York are you? Queens. All right, girl. I'm 118 in Pleasant Avenue. Okay. I heard the Triborough, which is not the Triborough anymore. Yeah, it's still, it's still Triborough. It changed the name. But anyway, I'm in Florida now, but I'm a New Yorker. So anyway, okay. now I feel, I feel like we're connected. Yes, we are. <laughs> so I, I, one thing I was going to ask you, and, and you guys guys might have just answered this question based on what you just said about the subway part. So at first I was wondering if you meant the subway in New York or if you meant subway franchise, because I thought you said franchise. subway. You did mean, so you meant the subway. Uh, do you know what? I thought you meant, I'm like subway owner. I'm like, who owns the subway? I thought maybe she meant like a subway conductor. That's why, that's why I thought it was the subway franchise because she said subway owners. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Must mean subway franchise. Well, see, somehow I franchise owner New York. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so, funny. Wow, that is so funny. Thanks, Corey, for clarifying that. Well, no, absolutely. I was just curious if it was Subway as the franchise. I figured it was, but I wasn't 100% sure. One of the things I like about what you said, Dee, and 
I heard uh, Grant Cardone, for those who know Grant Cardone is, I heard him say this, and that always stuck with me. He was being interviewed for Success Magazine by Darren Hardy, and the publisher of Success. And Darren said, what do you want to be remembered for, your legacy to be? Or what do you want your life to be about? And he said, um, I want to build something that lives longer than my body. Yes. And when you just said that about some, be something to be remembered by, yep. to me, like Shakespeare. If you think William Shakespeare, I mean, how many years ago did he create that stuff? And here we are, what, four or 500 years later, still talking about it. That's it. Yeah, it survived hundreds of years beyond his body. And how powerful is that? And it doesn't have to be, to your point, something that, that is remembered. It doesn't have to be like Shakespeare's right. song or something. It can be something that you did something for somebody, yep. and then now they've made an impact, and they constantly say, this was my mentor. Yep. Could be anything. So I love that you said that, because I think it's so powerful for us to create a legacy that lives longer than us. So can I ask you something? Yes. So how do you do that? I know it's a big question, but like, how do you start? Well, you know, I actually have, um, and I know it's just generally a whole more that I could add, but I just kind of like minimize the seven steps um, that I really wanted the people to kind of like get, get today. Um, and one would be to just create a movement mindset. Um, because to even say that you want to leave a legacy, because a legacy can be determined in various ways for different people. So what kind of movement do you want to create? What kind of movement did you think of um, when you created your business? Because uh, we were all born here for a purpose. We we're all sent here for a reason. So what movement do you want to create? I, even if it's just helping children. See, we don't realize that if, like you said, if, if I help one person, we don't realize how many people that that one person are assigned to. Absolutely. They can be assigned to so many other people, but because you have that one person, now that one person created a, a, a huge global movement, but it was happening because you stepped into your place and in your position and you helped them. So a movement can be defined in so many different ways, but one, you have to create a movement mindset. You have to step into that charismatic leader, that leader that, that has that charisma where people can identify that you are a leader and know that you are someone to follow. You are someone that has something to say. That's, that's I love it. A mind of uh, create a movement mindset. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay. And I have to add too, one of the things that uh, you just said, D, that it, may, it popped into my head right away, but think about who was the person that did that, like in terms of started the journey for Mother Teresa or Gandhi. Yeah. Or Martin Luther King. Like who, there, there's somebody probably that triggered it for them. So at the end of the day, they might go, well, my little small thing isn't going to matter. But what if they did that small thing and then Gandhi created the movement he did to the point where I think there was 2 million people attended his funeral. Yeah. Well, somebody started that for Gandhi and whoever that was, they might've thought it was too small at the time, but turns out it wasn't. So I love what you said there. You never, you can never tell who's, like you said, who else is assigned to make, create big things. So why don't you just try to do good by and good for many people yes. and then who knows where that's going to end up. But I love that you said that because it, it made know. me think with all three of those, there might have been one of the, like Mother Teresa might have did it all on her own and nobody right. inspired her, but I'm going to guess that out of the three of them, two of them probably had somebody. Right. A, good a good marketing team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, Def I just, I just want to definitely a good team. Yes, <laughs> Okay, so step number two, girl. Oh, and I just wanted to just add, even with the sure. movement mindset, as far yeah. as um, a lot of times as leaders, we don't take care of ourselves the way we should. So you should have, make sure that your health, and always trying to improve your health, whether it's your eating, whether it's exercise, you know, do little things to make sure that you are in 100% because how you show up, People, believe it or not, can identify. They can they can detect that there's something just not right with you. So it's mm -hmm. better that you know whether it has whether it's past hurt, whether you're you're going through something emotionally, or you know you know understanding your triggers as far as how those emotions are play in you as being a leader. Those are really really important tasks that you need to understand as a leader. How do you respond to certain tasks? How do you respond to situations? As a leader, you got to define all that. And that's all part of having a movement mindset, making sure that you are okay. I love so that, that you are emotionally that you're okay. 
I love that you added the emotional side because mental hygiene and emotional hygiene is at the root of all of it. Yes. So it's so important. Yes. And, and, and a reason what made me look at that, because a lot of times um, as leaders, sometimes there's so much unforgiveness and just people, there's so much unforgiveness and, you know, what's in our heart comes out of our mouth. So if you have some unforgiveness in your heart, you can be talking to just one person and they can feel that maybe your day is just not as great as you imagine it. Maybe you're displaying on social media that you're okay and maybe you're not. So it's okay to take a minute and to get some self, yourself together. It's okay. So step two would be um, a signature pathway to change. I'm, I'm taking notes. That's why my head's going down. Mm -hmm. signature, a signature pathway to change. change. Okay, can you elaborate a little? <laughs> yeah, so um, I say a pathway to change because everything starts with um, from your message to breaking it down step by step to be clear, to be concise as far as who are you talking to, what are you talking about, and how do you want to help these people? So let's break down your pathway for change. Let's break it down. How do you want to help your, your tribe? What problem do you want to solve? There's a lot of times where I may say, oh, well, I want to solve obesity, children obesity. Okay, so do you have any um, background in that? Have, have your family had that experience like my family did? So are you able to break down the steps in a clear message where someone can understand that I went from um, changing the way I eat to now exercising daily, this is an example, and now step by step to show them what they can do for change. So a signature pathway for change will break it down in simple form so they can understand what they can do to have great success. Perfect, so I love it. So you have the points and then under that are these steps that they can take in order to accomplish each of these steps. Perfect. But I'm just gonna I'm gonna just yeah. share. You don't do you mind afterwards if I share in the comments just the basic seven steps? Oops. You're breaking up. Am I breaking up? Oh, I think you're okay now. Can you hear her okay now, Dee? Am I breaking up? <laughs> I'm not sure who's breaking up. Can you hear me, Dee? Oh, can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Okay. Can you hear Elise as well? Can you hear me now? I hear you now. Okay. So step number three. Yeah. Step number three would be design it with the end in mind. Can you say it again? Design with the end in mind. So is that like looking at your goal and coming backwards? Yes. Designing your message with the end in mind. What the, What is the end result for this person? What end result do you want them to achieve? And then design your message, your talk, your speech with the end in mind. This way you're going to go from the end results all the way down to the beginning so you can break it down into bite sizes where it's even able for you to, to speak it on stage, whether it's in um, writing, whether it's in a book, you're able to break it down in small steps. I like it. That's so clever. So far, these are like such, each one of these is a mind seed as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> okay, yes, step number each one I do have them broken down, yes. Yeah, I know. I feel like they're little mind seeds that we could just plant and, 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 and nurture and grow in our lives even in our personal yes. lives. Um, okay, so step number four. It would be defining your brand. Um, what is your credibility? You know, what have you taken in the past? Whether it was courses, whether it was someone taught you, what have you done in the past where someone can actually uh, reference you? Because where, where people are really big on um, where did you come from? You know, who taught you, who trained you? So, you know, what kind of experience do you have? So actually being able to jot that down, let them know my brand is 
you know, when people see me, this is what I stand for. This is who I am. I, I, so I'm becoming my brand. So like, if you are someone that helps them speak, then they should know you as the speaker where I can go and find speaking engagements. They should know that. So allow your brand to identify who you are. Love it. Number five, you can't see me. Number five. <laughs> I see you. Okay. It would be um, a keynote speech, taking a stage, you know, using your, your whole article. So like I would craft like a 2,500 page article and I would craft it into different components. So one of them would be into my speech. And then I would turn my speech into various different steps, which, which I'll talk about later. But the first step would be is I would allow my, my take my talk, my, my speech, my article, and I would be able to craft it into a talk, so like a talk on stage. This is also about how I'm repurposing my life-giving message, writing it one time, and then I'm allowing it to be spent different ways. And the one way would be to talk on stage. So there's four different kinds of um, speakers. So as a speaker, you want to be a world-class speaker, but are you an informational speaker? Do you share industry information? Are you a transformational speaker? You know, are you a motivational speaker? Are you an inspirational speaker? Just to find in what kind of speaker are you? And then using your article, using your message, and allowing that to begin to share with the world. Wow, I'm getting so much information from you. Okay, six. I'm ta- look at. I'm serious. I'm taking all these notes right now. <laughs> Number okay. six. This is Number really six. just for me, Corey. Thank you so much. I feel like this all. I'm taking notes too, so I'm typing in notes. Though. It's all good. Yeah. So number six would be to use your same article, your same 2,500 page um, um, word article. And I know you said 2,500 pages. I'm like, no, oh no, my I'm God. sorry. I meant words. Okay. Words. Use a 2,500 word article that you just crafted to use for your, your speech. And then you want to use that same article. And now you can turn it into a book, a bridge book. Use it and allow it to become a bridge book. So now you're using your same life-given message and you're repurposing it in various different ways. And That's the next so step would be- thing. I have a client who is just talking about putting a program together and I'm like, you should use your TED Talk. You should use this. She's like, I can't use the same material. I'm like, uh, yes, you yes. can. And you, and I don't use should often, but you should. I'm going to should on you right now. <laughs> you should, you should. You should. Yes, you should. You should. Yeah. yeah. So that's what it would be. You would, um, number six would be write it into a book, you know, into a bridge book. You know, use your message. You know how many times people are using the same message and they're, they're talking about the same uh, situation that they've been through, but you hear it five or ten different ways. Right. Because they're, they're using, they're repurposing it. They're using it different ways, but they're telling the same story. And it's so engaging that it's not even boring because you're like, oh my God, I learned something new from this message, but it was the same message that, they, that you have heard over and over and over. So right. use it in a bridge book, you know, an 80 page bridge book. Allow it to paint a story. Allow your talk to really come alive in the book. I love it. Yeah. I mean, and that's similar. Like I have a, uh, the flip your script talk that I do. Now we have the flip your script stage. Thank you, Corey. And the flip your script book that I wrote. So it's the same content, but it's just used in different places. And yes. people learn differently. Some people they are do. audio. Some people need to read something. Some people are, you know, my talks are hands on and interactive. As an EFT practitioner, I'm like, let's clear some stuff right here on stage. Yes. So there's many different learning styles. So you're really actually addressing many different ways of retaining information in yes. your seven steps, which I really like because you never knew who, know who you're never reaching know. out to. Yep. Never know. And, you know, too, um, I love to write. Um, you know, I love to write for publications. I love to write books. And I just have to write. And it's funny because when I was a, a, a child, I could have been like in the third grade. No, the fifth grade. Sorry, fifth grade. And I used to win awards from my writing, all kind of stuff. I was a creative writer. And I was encouraged to stop writing. To stop? To stop writing. And I would, I would rewrite stories in the book. 
so part of me helping them craft a message is to help them rewrite the story. Let's rewrite the story that you have that's playing in your head. Let's rewrite the story that the leadership c comes into the meeting already have in his mind. Let's rewrite it. How about let's rewrite it from a negative to a positive? There's so much negative. In your the script. So you're helping them write a script and you're helping them flip the script. Yeah. and write a new script, the That's story it. that they want to share. Oh, we have to chit chat too. We'll have to connect. That's it. Let's, let's rewrite the story. We all, we are all in a story. Right now we're in a story. We're in a story right now where, where we and you are talking. It is all a story. It's a relational story, whether it's a marriage story, there's always a story being told. It's just a matter of how you receive the story, your perception on the story, and what you want your readers to see, to hear, yeah. to understand. So let's rewrite it so that you can now have the ending instead of somebody else telling you how your story should end. It's so true. <laughs> it's like scripting. And so, for, you know, my whole thing starts, the script starts in your head. It starts yes. with the thoughts of your script. Yes. You can use your negative script in your head to as a platform for what you would rather script. And as soon as we start scripting, and I'm sure you know better than anyone else, people's lives change. Yes. They become the star of this new script. Yes. 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 And, you know, and I just want to share this. Um, I can remember, you know, I did talk about in the beginning how I went through depression and my dad and um, divorce. But I, rem I remember once I began to rewrite the ending, once I changed the way I thought of how it should be, not the fact that they left me, but that they just needed to move on. It was, it was just their time. So now, will I sit in the place of dwelling on what happened or will I change my position? So I needed to change my position of how I saw the situation. And I took what my dad taught me to now help a business, to help somebody else. So his legacy is still living on through me because I'm using what he taught me. So I changed my position of how I saw things. And not only did it help me, but it helped other people see me differently. Absolutely. My ex-husband saw me differently. He, it all starts with you. I was just, yes. a client just came to me and said, you know, as soon as I flipped my script and shifted my perspective on the relationship with my dad, who did, was, you know, I could say tra like transitioned, but yes, transitioned, he, transitioned. he came to me in a dream. And our relationship is amazing because I shifted my, you helped me shift my perspective. Yes. yes. Because it's all perspective, which creates this reality. And you're yes. helping people create a new reality by yes. flipping their script and shifting their perspective so we're just like right I'm there you, I, I, I mean and I'm, it was an amazing i had that there was some things in my heart that i needed to unravel you know and this is all a part about in, in your book you know uh, your, your life given story you know you made you made a speech now you turn into a bridge book but in your bridge book you're going to tell them about you you want to make sure that they understand who you are I don't mind telling my story. I don't mind telling people what I've been through because I overcame it. So now mm -hmm. by me telling what I overcame and how I am happier, I'm excited about life, you know, that can it, it really encourage somebody else. I and I don't want to keep telling stories, but there was a, a incident where um, story I met good. this lady and because I told her my story, she said she was going to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But because she heard someone knew that they can come out of it she said i got a new vision on life and she didn't kill herself she said it and today she went on to actually creating her own movement her own help of other women to let them know that listen you had a bad situation but you can win you don't have to stay there it's not like we don't have an option or we don't have a decision or a choice no you have a choice and for me, sometimes I we just need a, sometimes we just need a perspective shift. And and, and 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 Corey and I talk about this too. You know, one and when we start to recognize our own value, then we recognize yes. that the words that we speak make an impact, right? Yep. So what we say matters, and it all yes. starts with how we're thinking and the eyes of perception in which are the lens we see the world through. Yep. And so you were able to make an impact because you spoke up 
you shared your story and your words and your script helped her flip hers. I, yeah. I it's just, it gives me goosebumps when I hear stories <laughs> like that. I'm like, that's what jazz is. You know, that's why we do what we do, right, Corey? I mean, yes. that's why we all do what we do. 100%. And I don't know if you saw, uh, I just put the comment up on the screen. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, but somebody just said, I love the idea of repurposing your story for a keynote, bridge book, etc." So true that the same story can deliver many different messages in different settings to different people at different times. Brilliant. And then another great comment was, D French, your energy and passion comes through the screen. So oh, thank you. just want to share that. And also the repurposing thing, just to touch on that, a lot of people say that Brendan Burchard, for instance, is like a content making machine. And I heard him share how he does that. And what he does is every week, he records, let's, let's say, an hour-long video that you're watching on YouTube. And then what he does is his staff takes pieces of that and repurposes it everywhere. They make graphics out of that. But basically, all he's doing is investing one hour in front of a video, and they do the rest. Yes. And I mean, you might not have a team that does that, but the point is still he's only invested an hour to create the original content. And by the way, he could do that in 15 minutes if you want it. Yeah. And still take uh, you know, one quote from each, you know, three, three quotes from the 15 minutes and make image quotes out of them. And that gives them three days of quotes on Instagram, Facebook. So to that point, D, I mean, there's so many ways we could be using the thing we're doing rather yes. than every day creating new content from scratch again. And that's what right. most people are doing. And then they say, like you said to me, at least, oh, social media is so overwhelming. You know, and, and it can be because, right. yeah, and I do it sometimes. I'll get into this thing. I'm going to create content five times a day. But then look, you know, look how much extra work I'm putting in. Truth is, I could just, like I said, I could just jump on a 15 minute Facebook Live and take pieces of that and repurpose it in 10 different ways. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So wait, we, we want number seven, right? Isn't there seven? It is, but can I add to what he just said? Yes. The, the, the purpose of me um, writing the article is because the article is my social media post. Each bullet point has a, bro a broken down um, piece that I can talk about. I can, I can talk about it on social media. So now instead of me having to recreate content, I'm going to go to my article and I'm going to teach from my article because I have so many bullet points, so many pieces that I can talk about. And your article cannot even contain all the information that you probably know about that topic. So once you start talking about it, you're going to see how that one topic, one bullet point, can be broken down into so many ways. So you're not recreating new content. You're just elaborating on what you already have. Perfect. Those are great tips. I love that. And I'll, I'll even say one thing that I started doing recently. I just started it. But when we're doing the Blue Talks interviews, the ones we do weekly, and at least this could be done with your interviews as well, but I, I, I paid Rev.com, if people are familiar with Rev.com, to transcribe it into a, a written article. And now I'm going to use uh, that on my Medium and Thrive Global. So instead of me writing the article, I'm going to actually do it like a Q&A that I did with the Blue Talk speaker. So now it's profiling Blue Talk instead of me, but I don't have to recreate it because they put it all into text for me. So now I can just go Q-A-Q-A-Q-A. Q, A, Q, A. I, I, knew, I knew about ripping it into a podcast and then having this, but I didn't realize that. We'll have to chat about that because, yeah, I got tons of content now. Yep. Just exactly. needed the trip. Thanks. Exactly. <laughs> We want to make sure that we save time as much as possible and we send in our great content, but we don't, we don't want to waste a lot of time because we do what we have our families to. We want to, we want to be able to enjoy the whole purpose of being an entrepreneur is to have to enjoy that freedom. That's all exactly. part of the impact. You don't want to only impact them. You want to also impact yourself and your family. So that's all part of it as well. So Absolutely. point number seven is create a high ticket and a high impact launch. Create it. Create a coaching program, a consulting program. Create it from your article. Create it from your talk. Let's make it into a program. Let's spin it. This way, now your, your same talk, your same book can actually be a program. Now you have another source of revenue that you can also have high impact, high um, income from your, for your own family. And now you're able to help other people because in your book, you could talk about it one way, like we said, but now when you come to your program, you're going to repurpose it and break it down further. So now you can help them get better results. Wow. 
That is just like, I'm just like, wow, wow, wow. Who knew? I didn't know who you were when you came on. But like, of course, I mean, I'm not surprised. Corey just is a magnet for, <laughs> magnet for amazing people. But like, usually they're from, a lot of our, our guests have been from Canada. So it's really nice to have yeah. a New Yorker in the house, for sure. How did you, go, how did you meet? Wow. Uh, so I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dee, I feel like it was in the, from the Public Speaking Speakers Association, which uh, Tanya created. And uh, Tanya Huffman, and I feel like that's and she's not in her head. Yes, D is. So I think I think that's where it was, and that was probably about a year and a bit ago. I feel like, or a little less, less than a year, somewhere in that range. Could have been a year, yes. So yeah, so that's that's where we met. That's I mean, that's a great group as well, a great group of people. Yes. And uh, I find most of the great, amazing people I meet are through different groups that I'm a part of. You know, whether it's I'm a part of a group called the Evolutionary Business Council, which I highly recommend everybody checks out, and it's a group of like 200 people. But somehow those 200 people are connected to about 5 million. I don't nice. know how it's amazing. How, and it's I, separation. Yeah, and the New Media Summit, which I go to every year, and I just was part of the digital version, uh, it's amazing. There's only 150 to 200 people that go, and yet I'll run into people, and they're like, oh, I was at the New Media Summit with you. And I'm like, how am I running into a person every week that was in the New Media Summit for two years with me, and yet there's only 150 people? What are the odds of that? So it's just wow. these certain groups, people are multiple places. And, and you know, so I met D through that group, which is another one of those groups where I find a lot of the people in there are just, they're, they're go-getters and they're changing the world and change agents. So yeah, to answer the question and go a little further, Elise, for people that are looking for good groups, uh, Public Speakers Association, yes. Evolution Center Business Council, and New Media Summit are three that I draw. Can you put those in the comments, Corey? Yeah, well, for sure. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then also, I have a question for you, a very important question, D. How, if somebody's ready to create this legacy, create the story, how do they find you? And do you work one-on-one? -on -one? Do you have a program that's group-related or a mastermind, you know, that kind of thing? Like, because, yeah, you got a lot of resources, and I'm sure a lot of people will benefit from reaching out. Yes, I am. Um, I, am I am creating this program, and I'm, I'm going to be doing for beta tests. And it's going to be speak, write, sell. It's going to be the same method that I just talked about. And I'm going to take people through it and allow them to create their talk, to create their book, and to create their hat ticket offer. And it's going to be speak, write, sell. And that's what I will be offering to people. So I'm, I'm this, I already have it drafted out. I'm, I'm only going to take maybe like uh, 20 beta test people and to launch it. Well, maybe I'll go through the program and then I can talk about it. All right. Right. Might, might as well share, the, spread the word. And, you know, I got to know what I'm doing. So I always, I always like to go through some programs and then be able to speak through experience. Yes. Right. It's one yes. thing to have this conversation and get a lot of incredible, what I call mind seeds and nuggets, but it's another thing to actually go through the process and see how I can evolve. I'm absolutely, always ready to evolve. Absolutely. And my, uh, my website is EC consults.com like e and c as in yep. change or yeah yep. okay. e c as in change and then consults.com so two c's then yes consults.com and what does that ec stand for something efficiency consulting oh okay Perfect. And are you going to put that in, Corey? Because for some reason, I'm not seeing it live on my Facebook feed for some reason. So I'm not getting these comments that you are. Don't worry. I'm going to put it in the comments. Okay, great. And Dee, you can also go and make sure that it's your contact information's in the comments. So yes. when people go back and watch the replay, everything's there. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So, Corey, do I get to ask my mind seed question? Hey, yeah, for sure. Or do you have anything else to ask Dee? No, I'm, I'm just, I type and I'm putting the stuff in the comments and jumping okay. over. And uh, I will say, uh, I know D, I see you on the Facebook Live. So just put it any of those channels because that's the new challenge this time. Last time around, we were just on Facebook Live. Now we're on LinkedIn, YouTube. So just put it at whatever one you're, you want to put it at. And I'll make sure to try to highlight it, just to okay. make it easy. Okay, so I love to ask our special guests and our brilliant thought leaders. Um, if there's one mind seed, I call them mind seed. We have thought weeds and belief weeds that hold us back, right? That keep us in old patterns. And as you talk about restoring, right? right. Helping people restore their lives. Could you share with us a mind seed 
a seed of thought that our viewers can plant in their very fertile mind um, in place of maybe a thought weed or even just in addition to the thoughts that they're thinking that they can like now cultivate and grow in their life as they move forward on a daily basis. Would you have like a seed to share? I, I do. Um, I would say a break. And, it's, it's, and the reason why I say a break is because a lot of times in the morning when we wake up, we may have our, our morning ritual that we stick to, but throughout the day, there's a challenge. So we have to know that throughout our day that we have to schedule in breaks. Some call it self-care, but scheduling a break. If you're working for 45 minutes, take a 15 minute break, take a 20 minute break and do something fun to break up your day so now it can reset your mind and allow you to come back and be more productive. It makes no sense to continually working when your body is telling you it's tired, when your body is telling you that you need a break. You need a break. All right, so how about you pencil it in? I love, I love it. You know, you know, somebody says, you know, if you can name one thing that you're really good at, and I'm like having fun, like yes. I'm great at having fun. You want to have fun, you got to cut them on over. You need an idea for fun. So I love your mind seed and I'm on it for sure. Yes, yes. So me, I like to dance. So my 15 minutes, I will put on something crazy. I will dance. I will have fun. Why? Because the, the, sometimes our day can be a lot. So let's break it up. Let's have some fun. And then let's come on back and more productive. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, you mentioned it. You to have fun, right? <laughs> we mentioned dancing and having fun. One of the things we used to do when we're just, we just bought a new house, so we're trying to decide what area we're going to have set aside for this. But we have a three-year-old and a two-month-old. Obviously, the two-month-old's not doing a whole lot of dancing yet, but the three-year-old, <laughs> we used to do a dance party every night before we went to sleep. Yes. And I have to tell you, he fell asleep and didn't fight it at all by the time we get to bed. And now we stopped doing it for a couple months because of moving and going through all that. And the kid is a nightmare to put to sleep now. It's amazing that dance party, and we enjoyed it. Yes. So we're actually setting up a sitting room where we have two record players. Right now, we're planning it out so that we have our dance party room. But anyway, that's how. Yeah, I have. I just went to visit my niece in Maine, and she's she's a little over two, and she always says she wants to put on a boogie song, and that's she's all about the boogie song, and she could get down, girl. She's got my rhythm. She's got her aunt's rhythm, but like, and that's what she does before she goes to bed, and she is. She's good too, you know, and that, and she goes to sleep. Well, yeah. sometimes, most of the time. Well, I mean, think how much energy they have, you know, like kids whenever they're yes. that young and they don't, and especially now with COVID, they're not getting that energy out, right? Like, thankfully, we have a fence in the backyard now, but we didn't at the other one. So, I mean, now he can just run and run and run. I'm just going to right. throw the soccer ball, let him wear himself out. But normally he doesn't. Like, he just, he goes to daycare and they're in a small room and they play a bit, but they're not running. And so to get that energy out, by the, by the time we're ready to put him to sleep, he's just ready to go. He's just like, I got enough energy stored up. So the dance party was like, you could see it go out of him like, ah. and he missed it. He's like, let's put on the record machine and dance. Because we don't listen to it. I love that you still play albums. Oh my gosh, we, we I have like four record players and I don't have one cassette player anymore, one CD player. I just gave away the last cassette player and it was down in the basement for about three years. And it had a Zig Ziglar. Oh, that's so cool. Well, it had a Zig Ziglar see you on the top cassette inside. That's how long ago I listened to the, the actual cassette player. I mean, it was a Zig Ziglar thing I was listening to, motivational tape from probably 10 years ago. Right. And then I moved it house to house and never used it and finally got rid of it. And I was actually thinking maybe I'll gift it to somebody and post on Facebook. And then I, I took the cassette out and the cassette, either one wouldn't push back in. I'm like, it's telling me it's done. Yeah. It wants to go to the. Graveyard. Anyway, I digress, but yeah, so all I listen to is records I listen. So, so, so we're in Queens. Uh, is this a person? Like, so you're in Queens. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so what's, I haven't, even, I haven't even been back since what I call the global plot twist. Uh, we travel a lot, my fiance and I, we RV all over. We've been to New nice. York. Yes, I know. We just got back from a trip in Maine. We're heading to North Carolina oh, next week. It. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's perfect. And that's about creating a story yes. and a life that we love and love ourselves in. Yes. Just making that choice, you know, yes. to do that yes. and incorporate. But what, what's Queens like these days? I mean, is it getting back to like, you know, the hustle and bustle or is it a lot quieter? Uh, slowly. It's just getting back slowly, but it's getting back to normal. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, more stores are opening now. Um, like, I, I don't know if you know what Green Acres is. Green Acres yeah, Mall. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> but I'm right there. I'm, I'm like maybe like 10 blocks from there. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, so it's totally changed. This has completely changed over there. Well, okay. there's, I know when I was there, like t- last year, two years ago, like the whole, all the renovation, like yes. there's it's all this change going on. So yes, the movie theater is not there no longer. I mean, it's completely changed. Yep. I know exactly what you're talking about. So yes. do they, build, do they build apartment buildings or townhomes or something? No, stores. Oh, wow. Yeah, stores. Yeah. Well, we'll have to connect when I'm in town. We'll yes, come if on. <laughs> if you ever want to come to Florida, come on down because we're here. Yes, I'm getting ready to go to Arizona in like uh, two weeks. No, a week and a half. So I love to travel. I Where love- in Arizona? Um, Phoenix. I'm not sure the Pacific town, but I know I'm landing in Phoenix. Okay. We spent, Arizona's the most, have you been to Arizona, Corey? Oh, yeah. Uh, my One of my favorite places in the world is Sedona. Okay, so we just spent Christmas. We just spent two weeks in Cottonwood, Jerome, Arcasanti, um, Prescott, and Sedona for Christmas. But what I love about what I love about Arizona is you could be in Tucson, you could be you could cross the border and be in Mexico, you could be in Phoenix, and then all of a sudden you're like in the mountains of Sedona and like a half hour from Flagstaff. So it's incredible if you get a chance to explore a little, like going going to Mesa. You know, that's near Phoenix. You're going to love it. I don't know if you've been there before, but. I have. Um, oh, you have. So you, I'm probably telling you what you already know. <laughs> <laughs> have you been to Sedona, did you say? No, no, but I've been oh, to Phoenix before, yes. You need to go to Sedona. It's, there's, really? a, there's, okay. oh, there's an energy when you drive into that place that I can't, I can't describe. You have to experience it. And at least vortexes. Like there's a map. There's actually an app that you can get that will take you to these energy vortexes and it will show you where they are. Um, and so that's a great little trip as well. It's only a few hours, maybe well, it's like four hours. I don't know if you have a car, but um, to Sedona from Phoenix. I think it's even less than that. I three feel hours, like- three, something like that. Two and a half, I think. Well, it depends how fast you drive, I guess. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's not it's not that far. But you definitely need a car. <laughs> you're not gonna, yeah. So, but uh, I don't know how if you're good going vibes. in for a it's good vibes. What's that? It's good vibes. And it was great to spend Christmas there last year. It was definitely a different nice. experience for sure. Well, enjoy your journey. Have a great yes. trip. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you for sharing. I love when we can leave our guests and our viewers with something that they can really take with them right. um, and actually apply in their life and then recognize that they probably could reach out and, you know, get more hand. Now, do you coach one-on-one? Now, are you coaching one on one or? Yeah, I do one on one. I do group. Um, yes. Okay, so they can reach out and get more assistance on, yeah, in the process. Yeah, I generally do one on one group, and I do organizations. Oh, okay, perfect. Yes. Corey. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And so, D, I mean, I knew this was going to be fantastic. I knew you were going to bring your A game, which you did. Uh, I have to say, the knowledge that you shared today. I mean, those seven. It, it's kind of interesting. Because Laura, just before you had seven tips as well, and really? it's kind of the seven thing, but both you guys delivered stuff that was just mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, complimentary. You know that, very complimentary to each you other. You heard Elise talking about how, like, she, those seven things, like, she's writing them down saying, these are going to change my way of doing things. <laughs> so thank you, Dee, because uh, if, if Elise is taking notes and she's distracted taking notes to that level, that tells you that's what, how you're reaching the audience, too. So. Well, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you all both for really uh, even asking me to be a part. I mean, I love Blue Talks. I love everyone here. So I'm excited. Team Blue Talks. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, and also, Dee, you got, I mean, there's so much going to be coming out from you in the future in relation to Blue Talks. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the book series, The uh, you're going to be on that stage uh, live as well in the near future, somewhat near future. COVID pushed a little further away, but you're going to be on that uh, Harvard stage. I believe you're at the Harvard one, right? Yes. You're, you're going to be on that Harvard stage. You are uh, also uh, going to be on the podcast. We'll, we'll actually be scheduling that soon to get that recorded. So lots coming from D in the near future. And we'll have to get you on for either the Flip Your Script Friday vir- uh, virtual event. which is- yeah, I'll reach out to you if we start up again. Okay. We yeah. talk about how to flip that script and rewrite the story together. Rewrite that thing. Yes, exactly. 100%. So, so we can chat. It's more of like a little chat. Yes, I love it.
Perfect stuff. So lots more coming from DFrench in the very near future in relation to Blue Talks. And this lady is also making big waves in general. Uh, she told me and sent me the details that she, uh, I, did you deliver it yet, the TEDx, or you're scheduled for it? I don't know if it happened yet, did it? Not yet. The TEDx is in November. But actually, I've gotten so many TEDx that I had to decline so many. That's a good, you know, that's yeah. a good news story to hear. Wow. That's fine. Where's, the, where's, the, where's, the, where's the winner? Uh, the one that I accepted was virtual. I thought that was a better move for me. Okay. Yeah. I hear. Yeah. And when you're a TEDx speaker, you're a TEDx speaker. I mean, they're they're choosing to do the virtual event, so it still makes you a TEDx speaker, and you don't have to get up and travel, and right. hopefully still can have the same impact. And so you have the, the TEDx coming out, and then I believe you mentioned you're also now writing for, was it Entrepreneur? Yes. Entrepreneur, uh, Business to Community. Um, the Good Man Project, Thrive Global, um, various publications I write for. She is a person on the move. Uh, yes. She sends me a, little, a message every now and then and say, uh, I just landed my TEDx talk and, and I'm just so proud of her, but uh, she sends me these messages and I, I've been doing this a long time. I can see when somebody's doing this. I don't know if you can see that here. Somebody's going in this direction. Uh, you're on the rise, so big things are coming. So keep on impacting it. Absolutely. Love Listen, I had to rewrite my talk. When that lady told me that I could not, I should stop writing, I said, okay, so let me continue my journey and let me rewrite it. Let me prove her wrong. <laughs> awesome <laughs> stuff. I love it. Well, <laughs> this has been an absolute pleasure. We already talked about how people can connect with you, so I encourage yes. them to do so. And uh, we'll call it a to be continued because we're going to bring you on in the very near future again. Yes, I love it. Anytime. Uh, Thanks. So thanks. We'll send you to the backstage area, but we'll be chatting soon. Okay, then. Y'all have a good day. Uh, Bye. Very cool stuff, Elise. And I know you took, as we said, many, many notes. Um, we're going to have our next guest coming up right away here. Do you mind, Elise, uh, just sharing a few things to give me a quick one second break uh, just to uh, run off for a second? Do you mind? Uh, just maybe sharing a bit about what you've learned so far, and then we'll bring our special. Sure. I got lots of notes to share. Oh wait, okay. notes to share. <laughs> I'll be back in less than one and a half minutes. Okay, I'm going to time. <laughs> hey everybody, so excited to have you here on the Blue Talks Flip Your Script virtual stage. This event has been game changing uh, for myself and for Corey. I know, and I'm sure for all of you, who have the opportunity to join us live and or watch the replay. We've had so many what I call mind seeds uh, that we can plant in our life um, to be successful for everyday success. And some of the things that we learned today are uh, we spoke with Laura Lake and she shared with us seven, seven steps. Um, and let me see, she has her event coming up, the Solopreneur Conference on November 17th. You can go to solopreneurconference.com to get your tickets. It's going to be a virtual event, extremely informational. She shared some of the, some of the overview with us and what to expect uh, on that stage, and I just moved my page away. Uh, we just had Dee French, who was amazing, and she shared with us also seven steps on how to leave your legacy, leave your story. I mean, script as I call it. And if you don't like this, how your script started or your story started, you can rewrite your ending. You can recreate who you want to be in the scene of your life. Um, I'll go over uh, quickly some of the steps that uh, Laura Lake shared with us. It's all about getting clear, getting clear on who you are, right? Um, get grab. Oh, you're back. I'm like in the middle of my overview here, but that's okay. <laughs> We're going to share all this information in the comments. So you'll get the seven steps from Laura Lake. You'll get the seven steps from Dee French. Uh, we have our special guest who I don't even know who it is, Corey, but is he or she? He. he. Do I know him? I, I you should, but uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to speak for you. And if I don't, what am I going to say? <laughs> well, we're we're going to get to know him as well, anyway. And um, yeah, I didn't mean to inter interject when you were uh, sharing your insights, but at the same time, I promised you a minute and a half. So I was. Well, I was a minute and a half already. Wow. It had to be close, I think. So was that a conundrum? I got to keep my word. So I aired yeah. inside a coffee. <laughs> right now yeah did you did you want to share uh continue or are you going to just put it in the comments oh, 
we'll put we'll put the seven steps from Laura Lake and from D French in, in the comments as well. So you'll okay, perfect. Well, let's bring on our closing guest for the day. I'm going to bring him right onto the stream, and then we will um, we'll uh, talk to him and get uh, to learn a little bit about him. Get him to perhaps introduce himself as well, um, like we've been doing today. Our, our theme, I guess. So let's bring him right on, and then. I'm gonna change the setup a little bit here, but Dr. Patrick Porter, it's so great to have you here with us today. Hey, it's great to be here. Great to tune in and hear what you're doing over there. Hello, awesome. hello. Yeah, that's good. We can leave him front and center. All right, that works. I uh, don't mind me, my, I'm, I'm moving out of the way of the letters, but that's okay, I don't mind. Uh, so uh, Dr. Porter, it's so exciting to have you here today. And uh, you are our special guest in the sense as well that we, um, every other day we, we've uh, finished at a certain time and we added extra time to bring you on because I think this is so important that we get to know you and your work. And uh, Eric, who connected us, spoke so highly of you. It just made sense. So uh, what we've been doing today, our, our theme is uh, getting our guests to introduce themselves a little bit and tell them a little bit about themselves. And then we'll jump into uh, an interview and, and get some stuff, learn some stuff about you as well. But Dr. Porter, are you okay to tell us a little bit about who you are and your backstory? Sure. My, my backstory started a long time ago, back in the 80s. Uh, my dad was a seminar leader. He did something called the Silva Method, for those that know that. So I've grown up, uh, made my first uh, recording when I was 12 years old. Uh, I have over 2,000 products sold around the world. We've sold over 7 million now. And uh, they're mostly, uh, we're mostly in medical clinics. Uh, just two years ago, we started going out to the general public and uh, not selling through clinics. I used to have a franchise company called Positive Changes. I'm the inventor and the founder of BrainTap. Uh, I'm the one who started this whole kind of technology here about with brainwave entrainment. Back in the 80s, I invented the first piece of technology called the MC Square. And um, since the 80s, uh, we've been in consumer electronics. Uh, but now we're, we've, because my passion was electronics, but my background psychology, I've kind of merged the two. And so we have programs that actually help people change their thinking. Actually, we have a session called Flip Your Script. So, I mean, it, it sounds a lot like that because we're, we're changing the way people think, but we're using light, sound, and vibration to do that. So we're using technology to help people overcome somewhat of what's happening with technology, our overloaded lifestyles. And so that's where I'm at. Wow. And so, Elise, uh, it's kind of interesting. And, and that's why I didn't share uh, on the brain tap side of things is because uh, Elise uh, is involved with EFT or tapping. And so I thought that's a cool kind of little synergy. And I thought at least you'd find that uh, very intriguing. Absolutely. Um, it's the same concept, but we just do it, you know, face to face and manual and have the, you know, have the client actually do their reframing or their flipping on their own. So yeah. conceptually. Our clinics all learn that. We think that's a very powerful technique to change physiology and change energy flow. It's all about energy and flow. One Absolutely. thing I didn't say too is I'm also the dean of brain based medicine at at Quantum University. So we teach a course in that. We have an instructor that teaches EFT there. So. Oh, I would love to have a chat with you though, for yeah. sure. Like I, so I, I was able to study under one of Gary Craig's students. So oh, great, founder, great. one of the founders of EFT. So yeah, definitely love to chat. So many interesting people today. Well, and I guess one of the things I'm curious about as it relates to that is how did you get into this? Because it seems like there's always a story about how somebody finds their way in such a, into such a unique industry. Uh, so was this something you mentioned starting to record stuff at 12? Uh, so was this something that was kind of from the family background or did you just kind of stop your way into it? Well, my dad was a very gifted alcoholic. So, uh, you know, that's where he started. And I was a very gifted troublemaker. So we were, and we had nine kids in our family. So when my dad got help with his alcoholism, he trained all the kids. And we're very fortunate out of nine kids. We have one brother that is off and on again. He's the one who he doesn't totally believe what, dad taught us, you know, it's from the families, but the rest of us all changed our thinking. Really, we, we flipped that script, as you say, because we don't, I, I've written nine books. My first book was called Awaken the Genius. And it was all about super learning because what my dad tricked us into doing was for sports, he tricked us into being very, very good at school. I mean, I became an honor roll student without really trying because I didn't realize my brain was that good, you know, that I could learn that quickly and that well because he was having me visualize football and track and wrestling and all sorts of other baseball, you know, and I didn't realize that your brain generalizes those improvements. And so when I'm sitting in class, my brain started learning. And before I knew it, I was 
smarter than I thought. I always thought I was really stupid growing up, you know, that because I was held back in second grade. I, I tell people Sister Barbara really loved me. She wanted me to her class twice. But, uh, you know, that's uh, so I was one of those kids that, you know, I wasn't nobody would have predicted that I could be doing what I'm doing now. You know, back then, of course, my high school friends and, and people even in college, I was more of an athlete. I was more of a non speaker. So when they hear over the years, over you know, 36 years of speaking in public, they're like, you do what? <laughs> you know, they don't even, but, but it's one of those things that, I, because I'm more of a doer than a speaker, but now I speak about that and I, I train and motivate people to use it in their clinics. We have 2,300 clinics across the country and we're in 120 countries doing this. So it's, it's, it's been pretty, pretty good ride and we're just now launching. I mean, we're just still going because we're going out to the general public now. Wow. So what you said there is so powerful and you understand this more than me about the the power of our brain and, you know, the idea of how people view us and think, you know, we're not not able to achieve this or that. And it makes me think I I saw Kevin O'Leary from the Shark Tank. I saw him speaking one time a bit back and he talked about how the way he reads a book, he couldn't understand the book until you turned it upside down. So he reads all the things backwards and it makes perfect sense to him. And then Henry the Fonz Winkler, who did okay in his career, yeah. uh, said he couldn't, uh, he actually had to memorize everything because he was dyslexic and he didn't even know what he was. Um, and then it makes me think of one other thing of uh, when I interviewed uh, just a year back, less than a year, Les Brown. And he said, I didn't know Les had a twin. And he had a twin whose name is Wesley. And uh, people, uh, the teacher asked him something, called on Les, and they said, oh, he can't answer the question. That's the DT. And he's and somebody said, "What does that mean?" You know, he's the dumb twin, Ooh. and that's how they, you know, that's how kids spoke about him at the time. And here's three people I just mentioned that have achieved quite extraordinary things. But it's amazing how we looked at what we thought were deficiencies and just labeled them as not able to succeed. So it's amazing how, like you said yourself, where you know people just thought he's not going to be able to achieve this or that, and look what you've been able to do. So what you know, or what are we discovering now about our mind and and things like? ADHD and dyslexia, a lot of the people that have those are actually high achievers. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, one, one thing is that they're looking at subsets of how the brain operates. Most people think, hey, I'm going to think a thought and we go back to a filing cabinet, we get, the me- we get the memo. But the reality is that when we think a thought, about eight places in our brain actually light up. And when those things light up, then that information comes in. What we now know, because we have the science, in the 80s, we didn't have it. But the, our brain has to be coherent, which means our hemispheres have to communicate. And as they communicate, somebody with ADHD or even dementia, which we found in our studies, is that the brain is really out of sync. So we can train the brain to do that. And, and we do that with light, sound, and vibration to do those things. So as you, as you think about training the brain, right now, as we're speaking here, uh, we're at a certain frequency. The reason people can see us is we're in this small bandwidth of light frequency where they can see us. But the reality is that our body is playing off all the frequencies, not just, I know there's a lot of negative out there about EMF, but there's a lot of, our planet is a frequency generator. So what we know is with kids, for instance, with learning, they know something called the Mozart effect, which means if you're going to study out there, if we have an entrepreneur out there listening that has a hard time recalling information, just play broke classical music in the background or go find a new age station, play that without words in the background. And they actually science shows that you'll actually become more intelligent because your brain becomes coherent at 10 Hertz frequency, which is a state called alpha. So as the brain does these things, the brain actually begins to operate at a higher level. One thing too, that's that's amazing because there's new things coming out all the time. We all hear about epigenetics, right? You've probably heard that term before. And they now know, you know, they, they, they mapped out all of our genes. So, but the reality is they only map 1%. 99% they said were junk genes. Now we know that every 40 seconds, our genes pulse light. It's called biophotons. That light actually rebraids the 99% junk DNA into the next evolution of who we are. So for those people thinking, oh, my past was this, the reality is you're not even the past that started this conversation. You are different at a rate of about 50 million cells per second. So as you change and do this, so one of the things we teach, like my program I did with Dr. Oz, which is is about mental resilience, we we put a program together for kids because we're, we're unfortunately a lot of times we're told what not to do, and it takes a midlife crisis to figure out and go read a self help book. And and I always tell people you don't need a breakdown to have a breakthrough. You know we we can have a breakthrough without having these breakdowns, and kids are having them all the time. I mean, so 
We can teach them to become resilient, to ask questions. Uh, there's a saying, question everything. And I think the, the main thing with our brain is our brain works best with questions and what we call endless loops or infinite loops of possibility. As soon as we limit it, then we know that the brain power that we have starts to shut down, which means when we're under stress, you know, so when we're under that stress experience, in the, I mean, I watched one of your TEDx talks about when you said talked about getting up in front of people and that's the biggest fear. Actually, the biggest fear today is the fear of dementia. So the when you think about it, people are afraid they're going to get old without their memories. But the reality is now we know through brain science, anybody can change their brains at any time. In fact, if we have time to go into it, I could tell you about a study we just did where now uh, Brazil the country of Brazil actually funded a study we're doing now for $200,000 because we got such great results with neuroplasticity with women, 55 to 65, because the brain, our brains, what, what, who we think we are is very different than what we were taught in school. And we're learning all the time that we are really super beings. We just need to learn how to trigger those, those assets we have mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And then we can rise above all this stress that's going on and, and not worry about I mean, we have to be concerned, of course, about viruses, but really, we're 55% virus anyway, so take control. You know, you don't need to be worried about these things. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things that, that I'd love to uh, unpack there. One of the things when you said about that study and about uh, things like Alzheimer's and us worried about, uh, you know, losing our memory, dementia, what have you. Um, so is, is it the case that people, what they're experiencing and what you're seeing is people can actually get some of that memory back or not even go there in the first place or uh, memory never goes away. Everyone has a perfect memory. It's the recall system. So think about it. Like you have all these hard drives in your drawer and you go, I know I have that photo in there somewhere of dad, you know, I need to find it and it's in there, but we don't have a good filing system. So our, everything about us is holographic from the bio photons I talked about earlier to there's a, a band of fiber through our body. That's, that's called the dura, uh, that massage therapists know about, you know, they, they relax. They now consider that like fiber optics through our body. That's why if you've ever been sitting somewhere and somebody walks up behind you, they've done studies where people look at other people when they don't know they're looking, but almost 90% accuracy, people will feel them looking because there's a field that we occupy. And it's not when people say, while well, they're a light being, you probably heard that expression before metaphysical people say that the reality is science has proved we are light beings. Every cell of your body transmits and receives light all the time and communicates. And even, even we're communicating through light through this medium we have right now. But when you're in person, you're actually sharing your light because you absorb their light, they absorb your light. And that's why when you meet somebody and you go, well, I like that person. You like their energy. You don't really know. You can't explain it unless you're one of these people that are sensitive. But you just know, hey, I like that person. We get, we have, we have the same vibe. People say, so all of that is happening. And, and as we learn and we develop this, we're going to learn more and more about our bodies and what we can do. Because we're just to give you another example, Corey, that when you're looking at me right now in the room you're in, you're seeing, you're actually, your brain is processing two thousand pieces of information. But guess how many your brain is actually acting on? Oh, wow. Uh, Only 40. But 40, it was 40 pieces of information. So that means what are all those other pieces of information? There are people can see things that the others can't see, right? They can see corona discharges around people, which are called auras or, you know, in things like this. Or we can see different things. Some people are medical intuitives, which they now know with accuracy, they're able to predict them. So we don't know. We call it, we call the field the mind because our body, the way we communicate within our body is called our mind. And really, when you go back to tapping, you're, you're correcting those circuits, really. You're, you're getting those circuits to come in and, and a block could be, we say there's trauma, toxins, and thoughts. So yeah. if, you, if you've had a trauma, you need to get it fixed, right? If you have uh, toxins, we need to detox. But most of the time, it's a thought trauma. You know, it's, it's basically their thoughts are blocking this creative resources that we have so we don't show up in the health that we, we want to show up as. And that can start from a very young age. I mean, they now know that. It really uh, does, actually. Yeah, yeah they, they now know that uh, some people are actually affected by what's said in the womb. Like yeah. babies have recalled conversations parents had while they're in the womb. And they go, "How did you were, a, you were in the womb. How did you know that? Because the, our bodies are always encoding information. 
you know, if we were to have a brain surgery and someone's to touch different parts of our brain, people have had full sensory memories without being told to have those memories. They just basically are there, boom, just like the matrix or something like that. We're, we're totally there. So we have that memory. So what, what we teach people is let's build the recall. And that has to do with Hebb's law. Hebb's law states that those neurons that fire together, wire together. And neurons that fire apart tend to stay apart. You know, you probably heard that before. It's kind of big news right now. The reality is that our brain is always fighting for resources. And it's pretty lazy, really, because it uses so much energy. If it can shut down and let something else do it, it's going to do that. And that's why habits are formed. It says, well, I don't think about that. Okay, great. I'm just going to go on autopilot. You know, but it, once you start taking responsibility and, and really focusing on things, we call it first attention. You know, when you, when you start reading self-help books and start going to seminars, start listening to podcasts like what you have here and, and, and other activities, your brain starts to crave it because it realizes that it gives you energy. You know, you get this energy boost. You know, when, when people leave this talk or any of your talks from the day, hopefully they feel charged. You know, we're, we're all we live in kind of an energy economy now. If we can, if we can uplift somebody's spirit or their energy sources, they want to want more of you. You know, that's typically the way it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to just touch on, you know, a lot of times you hear people talk about, you know, age zero to seven. And I always know it's conception to seven. Mm -hmm. like it goes past the zero. It goes from the day you became, you know, what you, what you are now right the beginning of the seed right once the seed is planted and it's and it's who's planting your seed i mean it go it can even go you know from the mother and the father and their thoughts and their energy that you're being conceived in i mean it goes back that far um yeah. so it's, it's it fascinates me i'm, yeah. I'm always epigenetic, yeah epigenetic shows we have seven generations back that yeah. are influencing us i mean direct influence and we're actually influencing seven generations ahead of time so it, it gets kind of spooky to think about, you know, what's happening. And they've done this work with uh, Clive Baxter did it with plants. He actually took plants, uh, cut a tree, a branch from a tree in the forest, took the branch into the lab, kept it hooked up to an EEG machine, which measures electronic uh, information, electrical information. When they would burn the plant in the lab, the, the tree in the forest felt it instantly. So when people think they're, they're located in their body. Where were we before we were this body? They know that we lose about three quarters of an ounce when we die. That's the energy that, that we are. I mean, we animate these bodies, but we're certainly not our bodies. And, and everybody believes that at funerals, but if you meet them two weeks afterwards for coffee, they won't remember it. But at a funeral, most people will say, oh, they're not here. They're in a better place, you know, and no, they're because probably we're, we're, with you while you're eating your sandwich. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we, we're, we are energy beings, you know, and we 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 have this energy and we want to we show up as these bodies. But, you know, what are we not seeing again? We, there's a lot. We And also the same thing's true with hearing. Our senses are very dampened down. Really, our brain becomes a filtering system more than it is a a, a true processor of reality. We're, that's why we have to take courses or, or open our mind to possibilities. You know, when, when you're working with people and like you say, this business uh business life and you know what you're teaching people a lot of people fail because they don't recognize they're part of this really the sea of information the sea of energy and they just have to find out where do i where do i plug in because there's no useless pieces you know right. everyone is what tuning in what frequently and what, frequent, what station do you want to hear i just i'm going to share a quick just a quick little tidbit sure. that Flex on you say seven generations before and after and we're just energy my client I just had a client yesterday and he said I got to tell you the story it's the craziest story we were able to go in and reframe his relationship with his father who had transitioned about a year ago and he was really stuck in moving forward with the with his father's estate and all of that we reframed the relationship he had this newfound understanding and respect and all that he said two days later my father came to me in my dream as real as can be he hadn't communicated he pretty much cut him off emotionally Emotionally, he had his, you know, we all have our stuff. Mm -hmm. And now they're moving forward together. His father has now come and he's, he's like an accountant guy. He's not <laughs> a big metaphysical, spiritual, you know, guy. And he was just like, and now every step of the way, the phone's ringing. We're getting his estate, you know, worked out because he was able to reconnect 
and understand and form this relationship in a very different way. You know, and I, and I see it all the time. Yeah, no, that's great. You, know, you get this accountant dude who's like, I got to tell you something. That's so crazy. I'm like, well, I'm not really surprised, but I'm glad that you're finding that things are bigger than what we see and what we think and what we even believe. Yeah. What we're finding is there's a brainwave that now they they now know about called gamma, which you might have heard of. And 10 years ago, they would have thought gamma was just a high anxiety state. But now we've been doing some research. And this reminded me when you said that we had a, a gentleman who wants to do work there. We have a group that does work with psychedelics and the brain tap, which is our piece of equipment, which I've never done. But it sounded kind of interesting if I was in a safe environment. But the uh, so we're trying to get people into gamma. So what we did is we did. We, we made, created some processes for Gamma. This guy came back, said he met his mother, just as real as today, and met his, met his father, was able to have the conversations they were doing. I think all of that's possible, even without equipment, like what you did. I mean, people can have that. Yes, so, we got down into that subconscious hard drive, did some reframing and perspective shifting, and he recognized things that he didn't, you don't, you know, we bring these childhood perspectives with us into adulthood. And it's like the three-year-old or the five-year-old's version of that. Well, they don't have that much experience, but we take it as if it was. So there's a whole process, you know, that you go through and I know that, you know, but yeah. it's amazing when it shifts, they feel the physical difference. They can feel the whole relationship shift without that person being there. Yeah. In my book, I talk about how I was blessed to be the son of an alcoholic instead of it being a, a bad thing because my dad got help. You know, if not, I would have had to be the one that did it. So you can choose to go down that path that if the parents taught you something poorly, you know, my dad didn't have a chance. His his mother was a, a lead nurse at a hospital. And then the, the nurses could either she was a drug addict, really. I mean, she could wake herself up with drugs, put herself to sleep with drugs. They were all legal. I mean, from the hospital. Now they don't do that anymore. But back then it was you know, it was very common. Right. They sent her home to they sent her home to actually die. She she was on so many medications and she lived to be 93 years old. Wow. So I mean her body was so toxic from her own medic self-medication. You know, she was doing her own doing it to herself, even though she didn't realize it. So I, I think that we're we're learning so much and just doing something you love will will do so much for your health. You well know? just as huge because that's everything like finding what you love is is really the key that vibration right there that frequency that we emanate or that we vibrate on when we're doing what we love you know i mean i'm yeah, sure one, you one thing i'm not sure if you're aware but there's 40,000 neuro cells in our heart we have a brain heart and that heart actually communicates to our big brain up here twice as much as this brain does to our heart so our heart controls the show that's why so many people die on Monday morning of heart attacks. So, uh, you know, when when somebody says, follow your heart or follow your passion, however you're going to say that, I mean, or follow, do what you love and the money will follow. It always, to me, money is always secondary. You find what you love and the universe will support you in that, in whatever level you believe you're, you know, justified to have. You know, you can have it all if you want, or you can, you can struggle. You know, everybody... The one thing's great about the subconscious, it always gives you exactly what you ask for. <laughs> so, Every, you know what? And it's very consistent and very yeah. persistent. <laughs> Consistently persistent is yeah. what I think. So there's a couple of things there I wanted to uh, touch on that you shared, Dr. Porter. One of them, uh, when you mentioned about in the womb and how uh, mm -hmm. babies can recall conversations. One thing, we didn't do it as an experiment. It just happened this way. But my girlfriend with our three-year-old, she listened to meditation. And she also listened to one particular musician, which was a kind of a localized or regional uh, friend of ours who's a musician. Her name's Christine Campbell. Give Christine a shout out. You might remember Christine, at least, because we had her on the last event. And she played a song for us and stuff. So Christine uh, had a new CD out. So Shelly was listening to it like crazy. Interesting thing is Sebastian, her son, to this day, so right up all until this day, as soon as he could talk till now, if we put Christine on and, and like hear songs on, he gets into it more than anything else. But if we try to put another thing on, he goes, no, he calls her teen. Put teen <laughs> back on, teen back on. But he's he developed, like from day one, he had this interesting obsession with her music. And if it, that wouldn't, wasn't from in the womb, where did it come from? Right. No, it was from the womb, probably. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so powerful. And the other thing, too, is um, you mentioned about the, our energy always changing. And I saw Deepak Chopra say this one time about how he said, the suitcase I'm here with now, I've been here in this city three times speaking, and I've never been here with the same suitcase twice. Even though if you looked at it, you would swear it was the same suitcase. 
And he talked about how the energy of everything is always changing. And he said, in fact, I'm a huge fan of Bob Dylan. And a piece of Bob Dylan has been inside of me at some point in my life because our energy is always changing. And I just, when you said it, it made me think of that as well. Yeah, they've done isotope studies, which I think Deepak talks about, where every great every person on earth we share that energy at some point. That's why, you know, we have to work together to get everybody enlightened. Really, I mean, to to live from a higher level because we don't just we don't get out of here alone. We get out of here together when we help ourselves and help other people. You know, that's uh, you know, and that's always been my motto. I, there was a time when I was asked to be a spokesman for another company, and I sold my company in 2006. Thought I was going to do that. For three years, I was miserable and I started losing everything, including my health. And I said, no, nope, I got to get back into doing what I'm going to do because money isn't it, you know, for me anyway. For some people, that might be their motivation. I mean, I've always made enough money, but it's it's other things that, that um, you know, I like to see people light up and, you know, get better. You know, that's the that's the main thing. Somebody just asked me today and I said, well, that's what jazz is me lighting it up. And I said, it's really selfish because here's the thing. I believe that we can live. This world can be a happier place, one well-being at a time. And if I can lend my hand in helping this world become a happier place, one well-being at a time, I get to live in it. So it's really, you know, it's really about us. We get to live in a happier, healthier world. Yeah. Yeah. My, I was just talking to my wife about that. I said, you know, if people knew that they had to come back and live in what they made. You know, it's like they make this big mess and then they have to go live in it. But people, they 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 make this mess and they don't think they're ever gonna have to deal with it again. But if we don't deal with it, our family is, my grandkids are gonna have to deal with it. You know, somebody's gonna have to deal with it at some point. So, you know, I think that, I think that we're the generation here that we're gonna get enough of us together to say, hey, we're gonna take back control and, and have a really well, I think there's going to be some really incredible things, even though it looks like some bad things are happening. But but I want to focus on, you know, you. energy. It's time for, you know, people to really come together. I mean, we, we need about we need at least 40 hours a week of creativity for, per person, because guess what? We would we would just be incredible creative beings at that point. You know, the stress dampens it. Somebody out there has a really great idea of how to handle whatever's going on today in all areas of our life. We just need to give them the freedom to to get get involved and get the team together that can do that. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And we listen, collectively, we asked for this global plot mm -hmm. twist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we want change. How we get the change really becomes none of our business. And we have to watch how it shows up. And we really got collectively, globally, this plot twist because mm -hmm. we asked for something to be shaken up and it's being shaken up. Yes. Oh, oh, everyone, I have a question for you uh, for maybe a person that might be skeptical, but uh, I'm going to throw this out there so I have forced myself to follow up on it. But, and at least knows about this. I'm not going to mention much about it today because it's not the right time to share it. But working on a docu-series project with a really big name author, and you, I think you'd be a really good fit for it. So let's offline let's chat about that because it is designed to help tackle the problems we're facing in the world right now. And I think you'll probably be a fan of the author's work. So we'll talk about that off air, but I just put that out there as a reminder to me. But Dr. Porter, the other thing I want to ask you about with energy, first of all, it's a two-part question, but were you always, did you always believe in the fact that we're energy and the world is energy? And then the secondary part, what do you say to people that still aren't on board with that? Because there are skeptics that I even will say, you know, we think about a dog that doesn't like one person coming into the air, but everybody else is fine. Obviously, it's sensing their energy and they're like, there's no such thing as energy. I have people say that to me all the time. So how would you deal with that? And then were you always open to this? Well, I think, no, I wasn't, you know, but it's been my adult life. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you were to know me as a kid, you'd know, hey, go down to the porters. We're going to have an aura reading party. I'm not kidding. My dad would teach us all how to see auras. You put a, if you want to do it, anybody out there, just, just stand in front of a mirror with a white background and put a candle right behind you. You'll start to see energy around you and it'll change colors. And if you have little kids, they will all see the same thing. Like they'll, they'll all mention at the same time because little kids have that. They still have, they call it soft eyes. It was a technique they taught in Silva. And so we learned about energy. Also, we learned about how to change the molecular structure of water, which now we know with Dr. Emoto's work, The Secret Life of Water, you know, and I was fortunate to know him before he passed away. And we use sound vibration now to put it through the body to change our molecular structure and, and do that. So now I know. But before that, I didn't believe in anything. You know, I was like, I was a real, I thought the universe actually 
the whole reason it was created was to make Patrick's life terrible. You know, that's the, you know, I was a very negative kid and, and uh, you know, I basically bucked the system every chance I could. And once I realized that it was me creating the miserable world and my dad pointed that out to me, he said, you know, you're the center of all these problems. And I was only like 12 years old, like I said, and my, I still remember my favorite Christmas present as a kid was when they came out with cassettes, which a lot of people out there were probably going cassettes. What are those? But no, they didn't even have those when I was growing up. So you, we, I got a cassette that would wake me up with affirmations because my dad taught me how to do the affirmations, and that changed my life completely. Because my morning ritual was terrible before. I'd let the alarm wake me up. Now I, I never use an alarm. I wake up at whatever time I want. You just tell yourself what time you want to wake up because as soon as you hear that alarm, you go into fight or flight. Your body goes, and so there's a cascade of negative effects that happen. That's energy. So you're going to start to, you're just going to trend downward. Now, what I tell the people is I'll say, you know, when you're doing, and, and I usually use the analogy that Einstein said. He's, he said, when I'm around a beautiful woman, it seems like for an hour, it seems like a minute. If I'm sitting on a hot stove for a minute, it seems like an hour. You know, and I said, what he's really saying is if you do something you love, like let's say somebody likes to do gardening or golf or whatever it is, when you're doing those things, there's a reason Jim Croce said you never have enough time to do the things you really love to do because there's no time there. You know, that's energy, the flow of energy. But if you're sitting in detention or you're doing something you hate to do, you have a job that, you know, I always think it's so funny when people call Wednesday hump day or they, you know, one of the things, one of the biggest shifts that happened for me, because I've been in business myself since I graduated college, actually, you know, the, but before that, when I was working is Friday became this day that everybody celebrated and Monday was the day that everybody dreaded. And that's all about energy. You know, what are you looking forward to? You know, and so I usually, I usually use analogies or stories, like even with my son, when I, my one book was voted the best how-to book in 1996, so it's been a while, but when, when they, and it was a self-help book, it was Awaken the Genius book, so we're going on this tour around the country in our RV, and he kept bugging me, where are we going, Dad, where are we going, where are we going, so finally, he was only seven years old, I took out a map, I taught him how to read the map, and I said, Tell me when you see this road sign, this road sign. So now he started ticking them off. And I thought, and then I thought to myself, wow, that's a great analogy to teach people. They, and we, that was right when uh, Ta, Tony Bazant started doing mind maps. And I said, that's a great analogy to you because a mind map is kind of like that. Map out what you want to do, check off. Now they call them milestones or, you know, goals or whatever outcomes, you know, all these things. But back then in the, in the you know, early 90s, late 80s, Nobody was talking about that. But the reality is that, you know, that's energy. When, you, when you're in flow, you have like this infinite energy. If you're in, in, really that comes to breathing too. I tell people, I say, you know, what's common with all negative emotional states? Does, do, you, do you have an idea? Breath. Right, breath. Lack of breath, right? Right. Like body that. posture too. They've got to compress. And so you've got this compressed physiology, you've got lack of breathing, but all you have to do to shift that really, it's not a long-term fix for somebody with chronic depression or something, but you can throw your shoulders back, take a few deep breaths, start exercising, doing some, that's why people change their whole, that's energy. And people go, oh, well, that's something different. They want to think, oh no, I'm talking about energy. Like they're talking about the underlying reality of all things. The field, if you want to call it that, is consciousness. So Everything's already there in this infinite sea of quantum intelligence. And there's this entanglement. So if you have enough energy, you actually basically, almost like Aladdin's lamp, you bring it into being by doing that. How many times have you thought of somebody and they text you? Or you get an email from them and you haven't heard about them from forever? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I was going to share an analogy because my fiance and I RV all over the country. And I would say that the I love getting in the RV and I'm the driver. So yeah. I like to just drive and take the back roads and we can go like for an eight hour trip and it feels like a half hour. And as soon as I thought it, you're like, well, we went RVing <laughs> the country. And I'm like, well, there you go again. Like, you know, you just what are, what are the chances that you got in an RV and you taught your kid how to map? When I that was the analogy that I was going to use about getting in the car, and we always joke, we're like, we just like we're time benders, you know, like because there the time is like we just traveled for eight hours and it felt like like a half hour or an hour, so it's really it's really amazing how time you can shift time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, this is not the reality we think. I mean, I have a book that I haven't published yet that my publisher said to wait on. Now I own my books myself, but I could publish it if I wanted to. It's called Shamanism in the 21st Century because I've had so many weird experiences. Like, how do you explain them? And when I've, when I've read about uh, shamanism, I thought, wow, that's what we're doing here. But we're not going to we're not going to shamanistic school or whatever. You know, and there's not just one of us in a village. There's hundreds of thousands of them out there. and we're all connected on some level of consciousness. You know, the reason we're having this conversation is we've already had it before. You know, a lot of people, you know, and, and this is just the physical manifestation of it, but on an energy level, it's already happened. Well, and you know, the other physical manifestations of it, like when I was 18, I had Guillain-Barre or Guillain-Barr syndrome. Oh, yeah. I had an autoimmune disease. It affected, um, for those who don't know, that affected my peripheral nerves. And basically I was par- I, beca- I became paralyzed. And one of, that's what kind of shifted this whole thing for me was that I was told that it could take two years before I might walk again. So I'm laying there physically paralyzed and now emotionally paralyzed. And I had this like knowing aha download or whatever, tell, letting me know that that's their perspective, which in turn is their reality. And I can create my own perspective and my reality. And it's based on what I believe and how I see myself. So I did an experiment. I said, in three months, I'm going to walk out of here. No cane, no physical therapy. I'm just going to go. And three, almost three months to the day, I walked out of the third hospital and they were like, what? And that changed everything for me. I'm like, if I can do that and my thoughts and my beliefs have that much impact, so does everyone else's because... You know, it's not like I know something more than someone else. And that's why I've dedicated, you know, my career and my life to helping others tap into that same infinite power that they have. Well, a lot of guru, I get to go to India quite a lot because we do a lot over there with the universities. But then I get to go and visit some of these gurus and that. And and one of them said, the, the only difference between me and you is that you think you're God and I know I'm God. You know, so, <laughs> you know, because he could he could create miracles. He'd actually create things out of nothing. And, you know, I'm standing right there. And a lot of people thought he was a magician, but you're right there. If he is, he's one of the best, you know, and, you know, in, in heal people. I mean, there's so what you know is there's a knowingness. And I think that a lot of people, you know, even in the Bible, it says, you know, you have to you have to believe it without, you know, you can't have any doubt there. And I think Wayne Dyer said it best. Says you have to cast out all doubt so the truth can remain. Right. You know, or I just say, you at least suspend your disbelief. Yes. That's the easiest in for me with my clients. And that's really what I really focus on is helping people tap in to their own beliefs. So they connect with what they desire in order for it to actually be able to manifest. Right. No, I think that's very good. So this is, I mean, I guess it's a full circle and probably for me back to the, the skeptic side of things. And I don't mean, that's okay. I, I just, mean, I, I just cause I'm always thinking of that person that's watching that needs this the most. And so for somebody like at this uh, situation here, when it comes to the power of our mind, where would you normally start uh, talking to them about how to tap into the power of their mind and how to make these switches and that, because, you know, for somebody that's not even started the journey, Obviously, it's a big leap for them to understand that they could heal themselves or like at least they could walk, get out and walk out of that room. So where do you normally start getting them to work? I'm sure there must be baby steps. To some degree. Yeah, we, we have a I, I've written a book called Discover the Language of the Mind. It's 13 core techniques. And we start first with disassociation because people have they put their own labels on us. Like I was told I was a. I mean, if there were drugs back then, I would have been on drugs, you know, or, but luckily my mother, I grew up in a place called Battle Creek, Michigan. The very first health food store was there. They had a Seventh-day Adventist uh, hospital there and they had all the health food. My mom took away sugar, took away red dyes. We, we, we grew up, we were the weird family, you know, we were the granolas and the, you know, you know, so. I couldn't trade my lunch at school. Right. No, yeah, nobody wanted. What, in fact, um, they told me I would replace, for those who remember Yule Gibbons, I was voted to replace Yule Gibbons on the Grape Nuts commercials. You know, so that's the that was the big joke. But so when we when we think about the first start is we have to realize that we are infinite beings in a physical finite reality. But we're now learning to break it apart by this at the seams. That it's just like you said, I mean, when you start, when when three or four people start thinking the same thoughts at the same time, and I mean, this is getting a little fuzzy here. And, and a lot of people aren't comfortable with that because they want to know, hey, one, two, three, four, it, it's not like that anymore. We're, we're, going, we're getting into the quantum field and, you know, things are happening very quickly. So number two, what I tell people is first, you got to disassociate because really 
there's something in, in quantum physics that's called the gap. The gap is between what you know and what you don't know. That's where all your power is. As soon as you believe in what you were or you think you know what you're going to become, you fixated. And that's where what they call the intentional experiment comes in, where you start taking all these particles and make them into waves. Or you take the waves and make them into particles, however you want to think about that. So you start structuring reality around you and everybody plays their part. And a lot of people don't understand that. So the next the next thing is, though, that inside of you, inside of every person and this is goes way back to even think and grow rich, where he said in the seed, there's always a seed of greatness in every negative. So the reason that I was born into a family that was an alcoholic and I had problems with learning was my whole mission in life and still is today is to help people learn to discover that you're nobody's stupid. You know, and, and I tell the story in one of my books, it was about uh, a friend of my dad's, uh, his son was learning Spanish and the teacher told him that his son wasn't smart enough to learn Spanish. He said, that's fine. Don't teach him your Spanish, teach him the Spanish the dub kids learn in Spain. Because every, you know, obviously they all learn Spanish there. So it's not about, it's, a, it's about styles and what's going on. So there's a way to learn and grow. So, but I believe that inside of all of us, there is a greatness and it's some people call it like Campbell calls it the hero's journey. We all have our hero's journey. And if we, a lot of people get up to the, they right to the precipice and they're just about to do it and they go, Oh, that hurts too much. Or that's too much pain. Or I don't want to go through that struggle. Well, that struggle, you know, uh, for instance, they now know that if you don't go through the birth canal, then yeah. you're probably going to have a lot of issues. And a lot of them have to do with what they call primitive reflexes, which means like um, how your body naturally responds. And they're triggered as nature created this way for us to be born. So we're ready for the world. And now they're, you know, a lot of, I mean, there are people that are getting cesareans because it's not convenient for the doctor to right. deliver them because they're going on vacation. But you know, also the flora and the bacteria and everything through the canal that's vital to the whole immune system. So, I mean, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole big deal about that. So, but, but what I believe is whatever happened to you, I always tell people, whatever happened to you was absolutely positively necessary to bring you to this moment in time. It might not have been needed by you on a conscious level, but to bring you here now. And when you realize right here, right now, you can either choose it as kryptonite or you can choose it as an empowerment stone. You know, let's let's choose the empowerment. What are you going to learn from this? And if it's not for you, what we do know also is if you can do for other people, there's actually a physiological payoff for that, too. They they did studies with people who volunteer and they actually get about thirty thousand dollars worth of neurochemicals just by going and feeding the poor. You know, of course, they're doing it because they're not thinking about that, but they're getting a payoff you know, their, their body is getting a physiological payoff. So a lot of people, and it's really about what she said earlier about reframing, you know, they have to reframe this reality that no one's a victim here. Nope. We're, we're all exactly the most toxic state to be in is a vic victim yeah. stance in right. the victim state. That's like, <sighs> especially when you think about when you're heir to the universe, you know, you have every right to have everything you could ever conceive and the only limits are what we put in consciousness. So, you know, in, you know, when, if somebody would have told me we, we were nine kids in our house, my dad was an alcoholic. It was so bad before my dad got help. My mother would have to go to the factory, get the check before my dad got paid because he would go, even with seven kids at home at that time, he would go blow all the money. So, I mean, in, you know, we didn't have much. Thank God. I, I became very close friends with the Knights of Columbus, you know, and our, because they would bring us food baskets. We'd always bring really good food to church when we were giving food because we knew it might come back home with us, you know. So, and, and you know, and, but I never thought we were poor. You could never, you know, but I have a sister that it took a long time for us to work with her because she thought, oh, her life was so bad. And we're like, you were at the same place we were. We had... We had six brothers. We were always out playing sports. You know, we always had out having fun. And I think that some people just look for the negative instead of looking for the positive. But there's a whole series of techniques. I tell people with brain tap anyway, what I do is I teach people how to think, not what to think. There's enough people out there telling us what to think. You know, it's all about 
how do we question this reality? How can we be of service? How can we how can we get more out of what we have? How can and then we're not getting it for ourselves because remember nobody gets out of here alone. You know, we're you might die alone, as they say. The reality is that when you die, hopefully there's going to be some people that are going to miss you. You know, because you were and but you train people to replace you, at least two or three people to take your place, and then you know continue because you know we want to leave the place, or at least I do. I want to leave this earth better than I found it. You know, mm-hmm. there's all this fear out there, but I do think there'll be a technology solution to every issue we have, whether it's a mental technology, let's say, a, you know, a physiological technology, something will happen because enough people are standing up now going, you know what, we are greater than we've been told. You know, we have greater capacities than we've been told. And I think that's the next step. Told by our parents. I mean, we could forget like the bigger picture, like what we've been told growing up, you know, and if we can change that and recognize that there's so many inner children that I work with, really, I work with the inner child. I mean, I could have a, a excuse my language, a badass, you know, 70 year old, something who's made a huge impact in the world, but really the seven year olds running his show. And until we get there and let that child know, you know, reframe and shift their perspective to get it as the adult. You know, our child, our inner child's running half of the stuff that's going wrong in our lives. You Some know? people would say ninety-five percent of our lives ran by that that fourth grade education because yeah. they, you know, and, and they're arguing with it all the time. I say you never win an argument with a fourth grader, so so stop it. You know, they, it just doesn't help you. I always tell people your problem is the gateway drug to self help. You know, it's it's the you have to solve that one first, and then you get bit by the wow. You mean. I don't have to be a smoker anymore. I don't have to be overweight. I don't have to have this negative. Edit. I can have better relationships. Whatever it is, I can be self-employed. Whatever it is, whatever. when you find that first thing, once you get a taste of that little victory, you don't slowly, you don't go back. I love it. I love hearing you speak. It jazzes me. This is what lights me up because I, and it's hard to sometimes explain, as you know, because it's, there's so many levels and you know how I kind of, I make the analogy, you know, when you have a drawer and you put all your wires in it and you put them in individually, but somehow when you open that drawer, all the wires are tangled and I don't know how they got tangled, but that's like our beliefs and our thoughts and, and, you know, how we're operating from conception. And so we don't know where to start. So it's really like being a detective, right? Right? Like you start untangling and unraveling all this. And it's like, wow, you see these people sort of come alive and they kind of come into who they really are. Yeah. One of my favorite metaphors when Corey was asking, where do we start? I tell people they want to keep digging up their past. I call it dragons of the past, dragging them on and on and on. You know, the uh, but it also I tell people your past is like leftovers. Let's say the three of us went out to eat. We have, you know, you're out with a friend. You go out to eat and you really intended on eating all your food because it was really good. But because the conversation was good, you took it home and it was in a white unmarked box and you put it in the refrigerator and you forgot to say what date it was, when you had it. And finally, something's stinking when you open up the refrigerator. So you finally get in there, start cleaning it out. You get back to that white box and you open it up and it's green and fuzzy. You can't remember who you were having the conversation with, what was going on. What do you do with that box? Right. You throw it out. You throw it away. You don't send it off to CSI. You don't blame it on your parents. You don't find some victim mentality. You just throw it. So a lot of our past, it's like, we were holding on to these things, thinking that they were so valuable. And when we marked them, like our brain went, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. You know, exactly. and, so and then, it's- then the brain goes, OK, it's just like a, a tickler file on our computer. Every time we log in, it tells us, OK, here's all the files you don't want to remember. Well, I don't need that. I, you know, it's eating up all my memory. You know, I want to free up my memory for creativity and for problem solving and, you know, joy. You know, that's that's the whole key here. Do you use the analogy? I, I use the analogy subconscious hard drive and you can delete files out of the subconscious hard drive. It's not that you don't remember what was on in the files, but it just doesn't need to take up that space. Yeah. I love the cloud drives now. So, you know, just store those on the cloud. If you need them, you can <laughs> always access them. <laughs> it's that's interesting. So it, makes, it makes me think of what I heard uh, that Einstein used to say. And you know, sometimes these things that we hear that they said, we don't know if they said them or somebody else wanted to, you know, put that out there. And but either way, it was profound to me. Is they say Einstein said, "I don't bother worrying about what my home address is, because I know how to find it, and that would just take up space I can be using for creativity." Right. Yeah. And yeah. I thought that because most of us use it up for remembering phone numbers and all this other stuff. He's like, anything that I can find with the touch of a finger or call somebody and ask them, 
Uh, from Think and Grow Rich, Henry Ford, they tried to make him look foolish. Uh, you probably remember that situation. They tried to make him look foolish in a courtroom. And he said, but why would I bother remembering that? I can call somebody to figure that out anytime I need to. You're right. and the idea is why store your memory with all those things that you can get at the touch of a finger. So I love like to that point where Einstein said, I'm not going to store those things that I don't need that are just going to be on autopilot every day anyway. Why hold the address every single day when I don't really need to know it because I know how to get home. Right. Do you find, uh, Patrick, do you find that with your, with the, do you work with clients one-on-one? -on -one? Do they come through a program? I guess that's a good I question. I do sometimes now. I used to have clinics, but now I mostly consult with doctors and other businesses and uh, do things like that now. But um, yeah, I used to do that. Uh, thousands of them, you know, over the years. But. So did you find that it wasn't about throwing out the the rotten food they didn't even know the rotten food was there they like right. a lot of times my, my my clients don't even know that this is the taking up the space until we get to that well with eft we get to that con that amygdala get into that hard drive and it just shows up and they don't know why the thought's popping because it was there but it was buried right um, yeah i think that, yeah they don't realize that it's an energy drain you know right. one thing about positive memories we could we could re reminisce about those all day long and we'd, we'd be energized but as soon as you start thinking about the negative stuff and, and everybody at some point in their lives had one of those crying fits, you know, where you, after you're done, you're like so tired. You go, oh, man, I got to go to sleep because it's a lot of energy that negative, the negative thoughts and the negative memories. Those are the drainers. So it's, I tell people it's like having a car that's got the, the batteries like grounded and mm -hmm. it won't charge up because all the energy as you charging is just going out. So and they don't even know they're doing that. You know, they. Right. So. You know, I have a three-step recognize, release, and restore, or restory, and it's about bringing awareness to it first, and then you can release, but you have to be aware for a second even of what you're releasing. Otherwise, it's sort of like goes, you know, they're, they're not aware. Right. If it's, if it's unconscious, like you're saying, they don't know. I mean, a lot of people, they don't know they even do certain behaviors until their spouse meets their parents. Right. They go, that's just like your mother. That's just like your father. They go, what are you talking about? I don't do that. And then then all of a sudden they go, oh, yeah, I do do that. You know, because these behaviors are ingrained and these thoughts are, are these mechanisms, you know, give you one example. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you speak more than one language, you have a brain circuit that doesn't shut down the rest of your life. That means you can learn other languages much better. But if you're like me, unfortunately, I learned one language. That was it. And then in college, I had to learn Spanish. I'm like, oh, my God, that was so hard. You know, and, you know, I did get through the class, but don't ask me anything but Banyos or Cerveza. The, uh, you know, yeah. the, well, those are ones I can find really. Yeah. In, the, in the process, our brain, again, it, it only holds on to the memories we think are important. So at some point, those were meaningful and important. But at some point, you know, they aren't anymore. Right. They don't yeah. hold us anymore. They don't, they don't give us the result we want anymore. They're, you know, like you said, the, the one his father had passed on. I can't tell you how many clients I would see in our franchise. We had 108 locations. So we would get people all the time. They'd say, you know, this parents, the parents are still winning. You know, I know they're not even here. And they even like what they did then. And now they're still taking up space. And that's a big aha moment for clients when I'm like, wait a second, you didn't even like when it happened. They're not even here. And now they're taking up prime real estate and your potential to be happy. And they're like, wow, I never. Th so it's about shifting the perspective to be able to see it in a way. And then you can start like what I call deleting or pulling the thought weed roots or whatever out. Um, but it, it, but there has to be that aha for them because I could see it. You could see it, but they have to see it. Yeah, Most people have like an epiphany when that happens because it's a liberation of energy. You know, like when you when somebody goes, ah, you know, they get that eureka moment. They, they've freed up that energy. Now they can use it because it's going to recycle and they're going to have more brain power. They're going to have more room for more love and acceptance, you know, mostly in relationships. I, I saw that when I was doing some relationship counseling. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, my first job, which was good for the people, but not good for me. That's why I didn't keep doing it was suicidal teens, which um, in this in Arizona when I worked there. And then I then I wrote the program for DUIs for the state of Arizona. So working with addiction. So those are two areas that are not real fun. You know, you see people really hitting rock bottom, but they would play the blame game all the time. But as soon as you could, if you could get them to shift their attention and, and teach them that they're responsible. I still remember one girl who was thinking about committing suicide and her parents were saying, she goes, my parents took away my car. They took away my phone. They took away my whatever. And I said, you know what? You're letting them win. 
She said, what do you mean? I said, well, if all you have to do is go to school, you were last year, you were an honor roll student. This year you're failing. I said, but it's just, how easy was it for you last? Oh, it's easy for me. School is so boring. I said, so just go back to school, do what you were doing before. Just fake it, you know, do whatever. And within three months, she came back. She goes, you know what? I don't have to fake it anymore. I love school. I don't yeah. know why I was even doing those other things. But yeah. she, people get locked in. Like she was getting a little rebelish, you know, and she felt like she needed to kind of show her independence. But she showed it all in, in, in psychology. They would say it's stroking. You know, she was looking for strokes, but she got them in a negative way. But we just got to teach people to do it in a positive way. Right. And get that same kind of response because we, we want to be recognized at some level. Uh, even people that say, I don't want to be recognized. It's, you know, they, some point they do want to be recognized. You know, they might not want to award in front of a hundred thousand people or something, but they do want to be recognized. And feel understood. Yeah. I feel like that's a key element too, feeling yeah. understood. Uh, fascinating. Fascinating. So I'm going to ask, Corey, you have a question? Well, I, I was just going to ask, and you might be going to ask the same question, but I know as we're bringing things to a close, I want to make sure. get in touch with him? How do we get into this brain? Yeah, all that kind of stuff, but also the brain, uh, the brain tap, uh, technology is this something that can be accessed by every person or like as I know Elise said do you work one-on-one -on -one or is it one to many so is this something that's uh, accessible to everybody so uh, Elise is that what you're going to ask how we can learn more yes I, want, I mean I'm interested we, we have we have professional licenses where we help people do this in their clinics because they used to have franchises so if people have a wellness clinic it's a, something they can add to that we have coaches that use it you know that do coaching one-on-one -on -one. they can you know we have over i have over a thousand three hundred different programs in the app so you can even just do it with the app of in what people can do to learn more about that is for 99 cents they can go to braintap.pro so that's braintap.pro. Then get a copy of my newest book called Thrive and Overdrive for free. They can keep that. Uh, it's a one you can read on your computer or on your mobile phone. Uh, and then you get 30 days on the app. So you can try out some of the sessions, learn about it. If you want to learn more, just go to, uh, in fact, tonight, Wednesday nights on our Instagram channel. I always do a live Instagram uh, meditation. Usually we have about 4,000 people on it. So you could you could tune in, just look for Dr. Patrick Porter. And we have about 120,000 people on our Facebook page that kind of follow us and do different things like that. Um, but we're, you know, we our mission is to better a billion brains. And to do that, we need people's help. You know, obviously um, we're very fortunate to be in countries like Brazil and India and, and uh, China, you know, but they are still, there's 300, million people here in America we need to help too. So, and we do that through people usually. So just like everyone else, we want to share it. So we have an affiliate program for people who are into the business side of it, but they, they can just do it themselves. It used to be, you'd have to buy it through a licensed practitioner. But when I invented the headset now, when you go on there, if you go on YouTube, there's one called just the facts video of, me, of mine. It's not a sales video. So people are wondering if I'm going to sell them. It's just all the science that's behind it. And I mean, we could have spent the whole time talking about the science of lights on a vibration and maybe bored everybody to tears. But if those people out there and the neat thing is that this year in May, I was supposed to present for the National Institute of Health. But of course, it got canceled. So we did it online and they published a paper we did where the, the technology actually had a 27.3 percent neurological improvement with women 55 to 65 with just one session. So they, they had me present that because right now we have a lot of neurological conditions out there because of low level chronic stress. So if, if you're feeling any stress in any area of your life for 99 cents, you really can't go wrong. Go get it. Get it for 30 days. Is, and this then, an app? You can, Is it an app? So it's, it's, brain, app. it's called brain tap Pro. Pro. Okay. I'm go to the website and get it because then you get it for 99 cents. Um, oh. uh, if you go through, uh, either Apple or Google, then you'll have to pay, I think it's uh, $7 a month or something like that. So, okay. but they can, you can do it um, for 99 cents and that way okay. you can learn about it. Plus you get the free book and, and the other way. Okay, perfect. And so we'll put that link in the comments here. Uh, and also, I mean, this will uh, likely be airing on the Blue Talks podcast and the YouTube page and stuff like that too. Uh, so I'll make sure to include that in the show notes. And so you said uh, the website is BrainTap. And was it dot P R O B R O? Okay. No, P like pro. P okay. P R O. Okay, there we go. Pro, they can okay. also go to. I mean, they're going to go to braintap.com to. That's where I'm at right that's now. That's where yeah. all the information about 
uh, or a lot of the information is about. But to get the free link, that's what I do when I'm on these kind of shows. So people can do it for only 99 cents that have, have heard me speak. It's not. Yeah, really it says 15 day, 15 day free trial. Is that the page? It, is that on the pro site? I think it's 30 days. I'm seeing. Yeah, it's 30 days if you go to the pro site for 99 cents. It took me over to the, all right, we'll figure it out later. We're not going to yeah. waste your time. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll put it in the comments. And uh, I think you'll probably have two people instantly because I think Elise and I are both signing up. So, um, no, this has been absolutely amazing, uh, Patrick. And and the truth is, I'll call it to be continued because uh, I find that when I interview somebody once, it always comes back around at some point. So this has been so amazing. I mean, this has already changed my mindset and you know to have that happen in 45 roughly minutes uh that's a powerful thing because i mean i've interviewed now over six thousand people and that's a crazy number so if you think it's it's not every day somebody changes my mindset fully and you changed mine and, and also i realized there's some habits that i should be creating not getting rid of that i think maybe brain tap from what i read in your site before interviewing you and from what you shared that i should be tapping into myself so yeah, this could be game changing for me on its own. And that makes me think it will be for everybody else. Because I think if you reach the people that are, are asking the questions, then you're going to reach the people that are listening to the answers. So I just want to, first of all, thank you so much. This has been an yeah. absolute honor. And you, uh, yeah, I, I totally treasure everything that you said today. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the conversation. So yes. I'll to work with you further. Really nice meeting you. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. So like I say, Patrick, we'll call it to be continued and uh, we'll see when we, we meet up again. But thank you in the interim. I'll send you backstage and at least now close out the day. But this has been an absolute pleasure. And again, I think you uh, probably changed some lives today. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. OK, bye. Wow. Huh. Amazing. I, uh, it's like right up my alley. <laughs> I figured it would be. And I'm like I say, I'm literally the second we're done here. I'm uh, getting started for 99 cents. And it's not having like when I put in Brain Tap Pro, it just takes me to braintap.com. Like it automatically reroutes me. So I'm not it, sure. It did why. for me too, but the page it rewrote it me to says um, improve your life in just 20 minutes a day. Nope. It just says free trial. Are you oh. going are you going dot pro? No, brain tap pro. pro. Should be just brain tap dot pro. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. You. Got it. Yeah. I'm going to go on and get me some brain tapping stuff. Yeah, I, I love adding to what I do. Maybe it's something that would complement, you know, the EFT practice, you know, that I do with flipping your script. I love that he does flipping your script too. So the flip your script coaching and brain tapping, it's perfect. Absolutely. And I just put the website in, uh, like I say, it goes for some reason under my YouTube one. So I'm going to put it in the flip your script as well. Yeah, because I'm not seeing a whole lot over here. So maybe it's just my computer. Well, no, I think, and this is the change that we did, and I'm saying this in real time because I, every time we do any change, I always say let's evaluate you know, how it feels to us and stuff. But with the StreamYard, the one thing I find is, whereas with when we used the last one, which is Be Live, and I'm not trying to give promotion to either or, but with Be Live, we could see all the comments or pretty much all the comments. With StreamYard, because it's on so many platforms, I have to go to the pages themselves to see the comments that aren't showing up. So it right. makes it for me to... To juggle where you know there's i there's like 10 platforms i'd have to go to to see certain questions right well we'll discuss how that goes because it'd be good to have the main stage be the blue talk stage here i guess are there unless they're all blue talks i don't know because i'm not on any other one but this one so we'll have to see yeah we'll uh, we'll figure that part out but, okay, sounds good. <laughs> but in the interim uh that was so powerful and I just put the uh, the um, website in both in YouTube and also Facebook. So people should be able to see it in the comments. And like I said, I'm not joking when I say I'm literally going to press uh, get started the second we're done here. But wow, what another amazing day. Uh, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm still I'm still jazzed and still have energy after whatever. I think that was like four, almost four hours. I and know. You remember, and I told you this. I think I shared this with you, Elise. I was moving right up until... Uh, about an hour before we started. And then I went live with Kelly uh, Filardo to talk about some big developments on Blue Talks uh, in terms of putting the uh, the uh, the book going to number one. Uh, also, the podcast- being on the charts, By the way. But, oh, thank you. Uh, and the podcast has been on the charts for a month. It hasn't left the charts, which is amazing to me. As somebody who's three podcasts, that's, that's pretty cool. Especially now, I just heard, I was at part of New Media Summit, and they said there's now 1.4 million podcasts in the world. Before COVID, the number I heard was 900 and some thousand. 
So think about that. All these years to now, it took to get to a million. And they're at a million and a half now in a few months. So it's a, so it's, us, it's a virtual world right now. For sure. So for us to stay in the charts for a month with uh, what, another 50, well, what is that? Where that is another 25% more podcasts in the world? That's pretty substantial. And then the YouTube channel for where we have the Blue Talks videos, which are going to be on soon, um, we're at roughly around 30,000 views now in a month. So Blue Tox is, you know, and we've just started. Well, you have so much, I mean, you have so much going on. You've put so much attention. You've cultivated, you've, what I call, I say, seed, sow, nurture, and grow, right? Until you're seeding it, you're sowing it, you're cultivating and nurturing it, and now it's growing, right? So it's, you know, very simple steps, seed, sow, nurture, grow. And well, that's awesome. And we started, the, I mean, a lot. Some for some people, it's like, Oh, we're just live now because we started a year ago. I mean, filming the videos, uh, then leading up to that, then getting ready for the podcast, getting ready for the launch. So in fairness, I mean, there's a, it's like the, the iceberg, right? There's a lot below the iceberg and now we're just seeing the tip. Uh, but I think I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned it today with us or if I mentioned with Kelly, but I have about 45 podcasts scheduled for next month. Like I'm, so I haven't even scratched the surface about saying, Hey, blue talks exists. Uh, I have a, and I won't say the name here, but, I have somebody we interviewed for the docu series who said, "How can I help you?" Who has almost a million people on his email list, and he said, "Oh, I love the sounds of Blue Talk. Send me it, and I'll send it out." I haven't sent it to him yet because I wanted to build it a bit first. I have quite a few people in my network, influencers who we share stuff for each other. I haven't tapped into any of that yet. So I say all this because I want people to know tapping thing. Tap tap tap. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and and my thing is with Blue Talks, I wanted to impact a lot of lives, but I really feel it has to be sustainable. So I didn't want to just jump in and put all my eggs into one basket in one day. So I'm pretty stoked for what's already happened in a matter of a month. But you know, I think and we, have, we have like, you know, last, the last uh, experience. So that was a week. We have this experience, you know, Flip Your Script Fridays are still on the Blue Talk stage. We have great interviews there. So these are all, you know, uh, opportunity. You know, these are all platforms for you to take and and share on your other, you know, YouTube and all these other channels, LinkedIn and stuff like that as well. Cause right now they're sitting in our archives and they're not going to be there that long. Right? No, hundred percent. Well, and the other side too, is like I said, we'll probably use pieces for the blue talks podcast, uh, for the YouTube channel. When I say that it's not the one we're airing this on, it's the actual blue talks YouTube channel. I mean, I just feel like it won't be all of the stuff, but just like pieces of it should find its way there. I mean, I want to practice what Dee mentioned today with the repurposing side of things. So, Absolutely. So I'm excited to get all these download recordings and podcasts to share on my Flip Your Script stage too. 100%. So that's so, awesome. And I love the scribing thing. So please share that with me as well. So for those of you who weren't um, with us, Wendy French was um, our special guest. She shared some great information and Corey added on to that, that you can take your podcast and send it over to where? Rev.com, R-E-V.com. And they will then take all of the audio and put it into text, right? So you can create a book. Yeah. So or, the, a book or something along those lines. Yeah. And the key thing with that is they, uh, the cost is low unless, so I'll add the unless, unless you're transcribing like a 10 hour thing, like, and it's still relatively low if you, if you look at the bigger picture, but I think they charge a dollar something a minute for transcribing it. So if you're, if you have like a 30 minute podcast, you're talking like, maybe $35. That's great. That's great. Um, if you're doing a book, like a 10 hour audio book, it's going to be like 500, but still that's cheap compared to getting somebody to voice your whole audio book. Uh, yeah. And or doing it yourself. <laughs> yeah. So, and I, I mean, that's reverse, like, cause you're taking the audio book maybe and turning it into print. But the point is still, it's still low cost, but I just mean, you know, it's a, just to tell people fair warning, if you're going to want to transcribe 10 years of, you know, of uh, recordings you've done, it's going to cost a lot if you look at it that way. But yeah. When you go piece by piece, the cost isn't big at all. So, and, and by the way, Patrick said, thank you for the interview. I look forward to learning more. Uh, so thanks so much, Patrick, for the, the shout out there. And so, Elise, is there anything else you want to, I mean, we're going to be back tomorrow. So is there anything else you want to share or mention before we log off for today? And uh, So I'm going to go into the comments here on the Blue Talks virtual stage on Facebook, the Flipper Script stage. And I'm going to put in the seven tips that were shared by Laura Lake and Dee French, two separate um, sets of mind seeds. Uh, we have the link that you shared with 
for Pat, uh, Patrick, right? Patrick Porter. Yep. And um, so that's pretty much it. And and watch the replay. If you didn't have an opportunity to watch the whole thing, go back and watch it. I have pages of notes right now. Yep. Um, so I'm going to take a break, grab something to eat because it's been a long afternoon. And then I'm going to hop back on and put that information on there for anybody who's interested. Love it. And I was typing away. People could say, I mean, it's a mixture because you're not sure if I'm sharing stuff or I'm actually taking notes. And I did a mixture of both today, uh, typing uh, notes from what people were saying that I thought were powerful. Normally I'd write it down, but it, I was at the computer. It was easier. Uh, and then at the same time, I was in the mix of sharing stuff on the different pages. So uh, yeah, it, it, this was one of those days where my mind is full and uh, now it's a matter of making use of this. But the great part about the replay being up for a limited time, as I at least pointed out, or notes that you take is, you know, you can go back to that anytime. So at least I, as always, I salute you, I adore you, I thank you. And uh, we'll call it a to be continued to tomorrow. And tomorrow we have three more fabulous guests. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I think you can, um, if you've been watching this, you know, you can just take it for granted that every day we have three at least fabulous guests. Uh, so at least thank you for being here. Help me co-host. I'm so glad your your uh, connection was working really good today. It was perfect. Oh, that was I changed my, I shifted my energy. I did. It never, it never was exactly once what I was focused on. I was like, I always have technology issues. And I was like, this morning I got up, I got into alignment. I did a little mini meditation. And when I went to my first meeting super early, I saw a rainbow, like a full rainbow that my, I just drove right through. And I was like, if that's not a sign. So here I am. Technology has been great. So have a great afternoon or evening, whatever time it is over there. And we'll see you tomorrow. One o'clock. Hundred percent, my friend. I'm going to continue moving <laughs> our, our house, and then I will be back here, same bat time, same bat channel, which is 1 p.m. Eastern on multiple platforms. But the one that uh, started it all, which is the one we recommend people watch it at, is Blue Tops. Blue Tops flip your script experience. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Thanks, my friend. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank an amazing you. rest of your evening. <laughs>